In the introduction to his book Spies, The Secret Agents Who Changed the Course of History, author Ernest Volkman ruminates on how spying, or intelligence gathering as it prefers to be called, is considered the world's second oldest profession. While it remains disputed whether it is spying or its older cousin that has the more odious reputation, what cannot be disputed, according to Volkman, is which remains more ambiguous. Volkman says, Spies are alternately reviled and honoured, rewarded and ignored, praised and disowned. This is largely a matter of perspective. As I have worked on the videos uploaded to this channel over the past year, I have come to appreciate the truth of this sentiment, along with two others. One, as long as there are secrets, there will be those willing to sell them. And two, one man's traitor is another man's hero. In this video, I have selected seven true life spy stories from the 20 odd that I have uploaded in 2023 and put together an anthology of sorts. These are the stories I found most fascinating, those which I believe to have important historical significance, or simply those which I most enjoyed making. Thank you to my returning viewers for your tremendous support this year. For those new to the channel, many other spa stories can be found on my channel page, which I encourage you to visit. With that, let's begin. The stillness of a frigid Moscow winter evening was broken by the sound of tires crunching over an icy road. The chief of the CIA's Moscow station, Robert Fulton, pulled into a gas station used by many local diplomats. As he waited for the tank to fill, a middle-aged Russian man approached him and speaking in heavily accented English, asked whether he was an American. Startled, Fulton nodded affirmatively. The Russian produced a folded piece of paper and placed it on the car seat before disappearing into the night. The CIA chief, realizing that he was the only one driving an American-plated car at the gas station, knew that this encounter had been planned. The note, written in Russian, was brief but clear. The writer claimed to have information he wished to share on a strictly confidential basis with an appropriate American official. A meeting was suggested, either in the car of an American official or at a metro station entrance. The note even included sketches of the locations and a code for identifying the chosen meeting location. The approach by the Russian man represented a golden opportunity for the CIA. If he was genuine, it would be a rare opportunity for the CIA to gain a foothold in Moscow, the very heart of the Soviet Union. Running spies and collaborators in Moscow was certainly the most dangerous and difficult espionage task. The CIA knew that the KGB had a history of using dangles or false intelligence volunteers actually controlled by the KGB to expose CIA personnel and gather information on the agency's methods. It was a risky proposition to trust the potential volunteer. As it turned out, the man was Adolf Tolkachev, a senior Soviet engineer working for Fazatron, Russia's largest developer of military radars and avionics equipment. Later described as one of the CIA's most valuable human assets in the Soviet Union, the information he passed on to the Americans on Soviet avionics, cruise missiles and radar technology saved the Americans an estimated $2 billion in weapons research and development costs. The establishment of the relationship between Tolkachev and the CIA would be an arduous process. The situation for the CIA in Moscow at the time of the initial approach was a sensitive one. Without any identifying information on the prospective volunteer or evidence of their access to sensitive information, the CIA ultimately decided against responding to the note. Tolkachev would, however, not be deterred from his quest. He again approached Fulton on a cold February night, slipping another note into the car as he passed. This time, Tolkachev addressed the CIA's concerns about a potential KGB provocation, claiming to be an engineer with access to sensitive information, but not being skilled in what he referred to as secret matters. He repeated his request for contact, providing new instructions for establishing a meeting. The CIA again chose not to respond. May of 1977 brought yet another encounter, with Tolkachev banging on Fulton's car window to get his attention, but being ignored. It wasn't until December that year that he appeared again, this time handing a letter to an American shopping at a local market and pleading for it to be delivered to a responsible US official. By this time, Fulton's assignment as CIA station chief in Moscow had come to an end, and he was replaced by Gardner Gus Hathaway. 
Hathaway had a different, more ambitious approach to espionage, not tempered by the concerns and fears of his predecessor. Tolkachev's latest letter contained more detailed instructions and drawings for making contact, as well as two typed pages of intelligence on Soviet aircraft electronic systems. Hathaway saw the value in this information and urged CIA headquarters to allow him to follow up and make contact with the unknown volunteer. However, headquarters remained hesitant, citing the recent suicide of its agent codenamed Trigon using a CIA-provided cyanide pill following his arrest by the KGB. His handler, Martha Peterson, was declared persona non grata and was expelled from the Soviet Union. Another dramatic incident that occurred around this time was a fire within the seventh floor of the US Embassy in Moscow, which housed the CIA's offices. The mysterious fire caused significant damage and hampered the CIA's operational capacity. How exactly the fire was sparked was not known, and suspicions were high that the KGB had had a hand in it. Not long after the fire, the CIA lost another agent in Moscow. As a result of all this, and to Hathaway's dismay, the director of the CIA, Admiral Stansfield Turner, ordered a stand-down of all clandestine operations until the safety of its agents could be guaranteed. But ultimately, fate intervened in the form of a Pentagon memo delivered in February 1978, citing the military's high interest in intelligence on Soviet aircraft electronics and weapon control systems, the very information the volunteer had offered. With this new development, headquarters tentatively approved contact with Tolkachev, pending an evaluation of the intelligence sample. While all this was going on, Tolkachev approached Hathaway and his wife once more. This time he passed a note containing more intelligence and a proposal that he provide more identifying information about himself. At a designated time and location, Tolkachev stood at a bus stop holding two pieces of plywood with numbers on them, representing the missing digits of his phone number provided to Hathaway in a previous note. Hathaway's wife drove past the bus stop at the designated time and obtained the missing digits to complete Tolkachev's home phone number. After careful planning, CIA agent John Gelsher, who was fluent in Russian, was assigned to be Tolkachev's case officer and handler. He conducted a surveillance detection run to ensure that he was free of Soviet surveillance and called Tolkachev's home phone from a public phone booth. However, the call was answered by his wife and had to be cut short. Gelsher tried again the following day, but with the same result. On the 1st of March 1978, Tolkachev approached Hathaway and his wife once again, this time passing 11 pages of handwritten materials containing detailed intelligence on Soviet research and development efforts in military aircraft. He revealed his full identity, including his name, address, employment and personal background. Desperate for a positive response to his efforts, he warned that if he did not receive one this time, he would give up. CIA headquarters finally relented and gave its approval for formal communication with Tolkachev to commence. Later that month, in March 1978, Gelsher managed to contact Tolkachev over the phone to confirm that Tolkachev's materials had been received and to discuss future communication. In August, Tolkachev received a dead drop containing operational instructions, intelligence requirements, secret writing materials, cover letters, and a one-time pad for writing encrypted messages. Tolkachev sent three cover letters to the CIA, all containing valuable intelligence. He also indicated that he had 91 pages of handwritten notes he wanted to pass on. In response, a plan was approved for a personal meeting between Gelsher and Tolkachev to establish an in-country communication system. The first personal meeting took place on New Year's Day 1979, and Tolkachev delivered the 91 pages of notes which contained detailed information about his work on Soviet radar and weapon systems. The CIA's Office of Technical Service analyzed one of Tolkachev's handwritten notes and were struck by the writer's intelligence and purposefulness. They noted his self-discipline, observant, and conscientious approach. As Tolkachev slowly revealed more about himself, it became clear that he was driven by a desire to work against the Soviet regime due to the brutal treatment of his wife's parents. Tolkachev had married at 30 and had been with his wife, Natasha, for 22 years. Natasha grew up without her parents due to Joseph Stalin's purges in the 1930s. Natasha was just two years old when her mother was executed for nothing more than having visited her father, a foreign businessman living in Denmark. After refusing to denounce his wife, Natasha's father was sent to a labor camp. As a result, Natasha was sent to an orphanage and did not see her father again until she was 18 years old. Her father died three years later. Natasha was known for her opposition to the Soviet party state, reading banned literature and distributing copies of it. She was the only person in her group to vote against the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968. Her experiences and beliefs deeply influenced Tolkachev as well. The couple had a son, Oleg, who was studying at an architectural institute. Tolkachev made it clear that he had not and would not reveal his work for U.S. intelligence to his family. 
With a background in optical mechanical radar training and a degree from the Kharkov Polytechnical Institute, Tolkachev worked as a leading systems designer at the Scientific Research Institute of Radar. He earned a comfortable salary and occasionally received monetary awards for his inventions in the field. Tolkachev's job allowed him access to valuable information on new Soviet weapon systems. Tolkachev himself was not a member of the Communist Party and had lost his interest in politics due to its hypocritical demagogy. His motivations for approaching US intelligence were clear. He was a dissident at heart who wanted to contribute to the cause through his access to unique, valuable information. In one of his letters, Tolkachev wrote about his decision to become a spy, saying that some inner worm had started to torment him and something had to be done. He considered getting in contact with underground dissident groups, but thought the access to the valuable information at his fingertips was a far more promising opportunity. Despite the dangers involved to him personally and to his family, Tolkachev was determined to see his plan through. He had no intention of turning back and was willing to do whatever he could to damage the Soviet regime. In the midst of a complex and risky espionage operation, the question of remuneration proved to be a difficult matter for Tolkachev and the CIA to resolve. Tolkachev, who was primarily interested in being compensated as a sign of the value the CIA placed on his work, had initially proposed a seven-stage plan in which he would pass information to the CIA over a 12-year period. As compensation, Tolkachev demanded that he be paid a sum in the six figures, which, according to a radio program he heard on Voice of America, was in the region of what Belenko was paid when he defected to the West by flying his MiG-25 to Japan. In response, the CIA informed Tolkachev that the Director of Central Intelligence had approved payment of an amount in rubles equivalent to almost 100,000 US dollars. Tolkachev, however, pointed out that he had made a mistake. When he referred to six figures, what he meant was in fact six zeros, which was a seven-figure sum. He argued that the amount the Soviet Union would have to spend to re-equip its MiG-25s was estimated at $3 billion, and given the nature of the information he was providing to the CIA, several million dollars was a fair price. Despite the back and forth on the issue of compensation, Tolkachev made it clear that his primary goal was to pass as much information as possible to the CIA in the shortest amount of time, regardless of the potential danger. It was eventually agreed that Tolkachev would be paid the equivalent of the salary of the US president, increasing for each year he continued to work productively. The bulk of the funds were to be held in escrow in the West, serving as a financial parachute should Tolkachev ever require extraction from behind the Iron Curtain. Tolkachev lived in a comfortable apartment in a building he shared with the Soviet aviation and missile elite. He was paid a good salary and had no real need to be so handsomely compensated, not least of which was the fact that the scarcity of consumer goods in Moscow at the time meant that he wasn't able to spend his earnings in any event. Throughout his relationship with the CIA, Tolkachev was consistently concerned with the well-being and interests of his son Oleg. He frequently requested Western music, stereo equipment and other personal items for Oleg, as well as asking for advice on how to receive Western radio broadcasts. In February of 1979, the CIA left a dead drop for Tolkachev containing a small spy camera, instructions and an operational note. The note contained a communications plan that included phone calls, personal meetings and dead drop exchanges. Tolkachev preferred personal meetings, feeling they were more productive and less risky than dead drops. As a result, beginning in April 1979, Personal meetings with Tolkachev became the primary method of communication, with over 20 taking place over the next five years. These meetings allowed Tolkachev to pass on hundreds of rolls of film and hundreds of pages of documents, including blueprints and technical manuals. The information provided by Tolkachev was invaluable to the US, giving them insights into Soviet military capabilities and helping to shape American defense strategy. But as Tolkachev's cooperation with the CIA became known to the Soviet authorities, he faced increasing danger, leading to a dramatic finale to the operation. Tolkachev encountered a number of technical challenges while collecting the vast amounts of data at his disposal in secret. In particular, the miniature camera provided to him in February of 1979 proved difficult to use. It required more light than was available, and its small size made it hard to hold steady, resulting in blurry images. Tolkachev also complained that the camera clicked too loudly and had to be propped up on books to reach the proper height for photography. In June 1979, Tolkachev suggested using a regular 35mm camera and taking sensitive documents home over the lunch hour to photograph them. This suggestion proved successful and in meetings held in October and December 1979, Tolkachev provided over 150 rolls of film of excellent quality along with accompanying notes and new intelligence. 
Tolkachev was, however, also given six new miniature spy cameras for use at his office, which was a decision that proved to be a wise one. In December 1979, Tolkachev's institute implemented new security measures that made it difficult for him to take sensitive documents home to photograph. Previously, institute staff could check out an unlimited number of documents from the library as long as they were returned by the end of the day, but now they had to leave their building pass at the library in order to check out documents. This meant that Tolkachev couldn't leave the building without showing his pass, and this made it impossible for him to take documents home. As a result, Tolkachev had to photograph documents at the institute using the new spy cameras, which he informed the CIA were only safe to use in the men's toilet. Despite the danger and difficulty, Tolkachev exposed all the frames of four of the six cameras during this period and passed the film to a CIA case officer in a personal meeting in February of 1980. Despite the success of the new miniature cameras given to Tolkachev, he still preferred to photograph documents at home with his 35mm Pentax camera. He continued to find the CIA's miniature cameras challenging to use due to low light conditions and the difficulty in holding the camera steady. To overcome the new security restrictions, Tolkachev suggested that the CIA create a fake copy of his building pass so that he could leave the real one at the library while checking out documents. Fortunately, the new security measures were eventually cancelled in February 1980 due to complaints from the majority of Institute's staff, and so Tolkachev no longer had a need for a fake building pass. This allowed Tolkachev to resume photographing documents at home, and in June 1980 he passed almost 200 rolls of film, the largest amount he had ever turned over in one meeting. In December 1979, a Defense Department memorandum noted that Tolkachev's information had caused the Air Force to completely change its direction on a multi-million dollar electronics package for one of its latest fighter planes. Tolkachev was highly praised for the information he provided on the latest generation of Soviet surface-to-air missile systems and on jam-proofing tests for Soviet fighter aircraft radar systems. In June 1980, Tolkachev provided unique information on a new Soviet aircraft design, extensive information on modifications to another Soviet fighter aircraft, and documents on several new models of airborne missile systems. The information that Tolkachev was providing was of such a secret nature and in the early stages of development that it was assessed that the value of the information he provided would not diminish for at least 8 to 10 years, as it would take the Soviets that long to design, test and deploy new technology to replace what he had compromised to the CIA. Over the course of the operation, there were various case officers assigned to handle Tolkachev's spying. The aforementioned John Gelsher, while not having recruited Tolkachev directly, very quickly established a relationship of trust and a smooth meeting system. Gelsher handed Tolkachev over to a second case officer, David Rolf, in October 1981. Rolf too was able to earn Tolkachev's trust, but as time went on, the traditional case officer function became more difficult given the constant KGB surveillance preventing meetings from taking place. In early 1982, Burton Gerber, the CIA Moscow station chief, developed a plan to enhance the Moscow station's capabilities by incorporating a small number of case officers who would operate under so-called deep cover and be completely undetectable by the KGB. These officers would maintain a low profile by working in unassuming jobs and leading mundane lives, thereby minimizing KGB attention. This approach was referred to as black cover and was intended to increase security. Robert Morris was the first deep cover agent to be assigned to Tolkachev in July 1982, his cover being that of a State Department bureaucrat. As the operation progressed, the CIA had to plan for its inevitable end. This included making plans for Tolkachev's exfiltration. The CIA had quickly agreed to offer exfiltration to Tolkachev and his family, but wanted to delay their departure from the USSR for as long as possible to maximize the benefits of his access. Tolkachev also thought about the end of his relationship with the CIA, but with a different focus. In April 1979, he had requested a poison pill, or cyanide capsule, stating that he didn't want to be questioned by the KGB if he was ever caught. Initially, the CIA officers handling the case resisted these requests, but they eventually concluded that Tolkachev would not be dissuaded and referred the matter to the CIA director, who refused to authorize the issuance of a poison pill. After being informed of this decision, Tolkachev wrote a letter to the CIA director in June 1980. In the letter, Tolkachev outlined the risks he was taking and insisted on being given the means to commit suicide due to his precarious security situation. Tolkachev pointed out that if the KGB ever suspected a leak of information, a review of the document's sign-out permission cards would quickly identify him as the prime suspect. He also noted that if the KGB searched his apartment, he would not be able to hide anything from them. 
by having a means to commit suicide. Tolkachev argued that he could keep secret the volume of his activity and the methods by which he was able to carry it out. Ultimately, the CIA conceded, presumably after weighing up the ethics and morals of the matter and provided Tolkachev with a poison pill. In the same letter, Tolkachev also expressed his desire for exfiltration preparations for himself, his wife and his son to begin as soon as possible and asked for guidance on what he needed to do to support the planning. One of the exfiltration plans included a car pickup in Leningrad and smuggling Tolkachev and his family into Finland in a special hiding cavity in the vehicle. An alternative plan involved a pickup on the outskirts of Moscow and their removal from the country by controlled aircraft or a modified vehicle. In March 1983, a written note was passed to Tolkachev outlining the exfiltration plan and suggesting a meeting in April to discuss it further. Tolkachev, however, did an about turn on his desire for an exfiltration plan, explaining that his wife and son did not want to leave the Soviet Union due to their love for their homeland and a fear of being homesick. In the summer and early autumn of 1983, the CIA began to struggle to hold meetings with Tolkachev. Five attempts to meet with the agent failed, with Tolkachev missing three appointments and the CIA being unable to shake surveillance for two others. Finally, in November, Tolkachev and his case officer were able to meet and the agent provided handwritten notes but no film, citing security concerns. The reason for Tolkachev having missed his meetings and the increased KGB surveillance was because of a security investigation conducted in April 1983 within Tolkachev's office. The investigation surrounded suspicions of information leaks relating to a Soviet fighter aircraft target recognition system. Naturally, Tolkachev feared for his safety and stopped taking photographs for the CIA during the investigation. More so, he took a trip to his country Dacha where he destroyed incriminating items in his possession and burned documents and money paid to him by the CIA. Tolkachev seemingly emerged from this investigation unscathed. Between April and October 1984, the CIA debated the balance between Tolkachev's productivity versus his personal security, the latter of which was the top priority. As a result, Tolkachev was told that he should no longer photograph documents at home as transporting them from and to his office was too risky. Tolkachev insisted on being given a Pentax camera for use at home, but the CIA maintained that it was too risky and did not do so. They also recommended that he not ask for access to documents not directly related to the projects he was working on. Tolkachev was undeniably an incredibly driven man, and this showed in the ever-increasing risks he took to obtain documents and secret information for the CIA. He suffered from high blood pressure and there were question marks about his health and ability to continue to produce good intel. Notwithstanding the efforts of the CIA to slow Tolkachev down, he continued on relentlessly. In January 1985, Tolkachev met again with his CIA case officer, providing more useful intelligence and operational information. Little did the CIA know, however, that disaster was about to strike. In early March 1985, the CIA signaled to Tolkachev that they wanted a meeting, but Tolkachev did not signal his availability. In mid-March, Tolkachev appeared to signal his readiness to meet by opening a transom window in his apartment, which was the accepted signal for meetings. It is possible, however, that he was trying to indicate that he was in trouble, but Tolkachev did not appear for the meeting. All went quiet until the 5th of June 1985, when Tolkachev signaled his readiness to meet. This time, however, the case officer was unable to make the meeting due to heavy KGB surveillance. On the 13th of June 1985, the window to Tolkachev's apartment was left open, and which the CIA took as a sign to attempt another meeting. Given the ever-increasing KGB surveillance, it was decided that a substitute case officer, Paul Skip Stombau, would attend the meeting. The case officer did not detect any surveillance on the way to the meeting site and proceeded to the designated spot. However, at the exact time of the meeting, the case officer was suddenly arrested by more than a dozen KGB security personnel dressed in camouflage uniforms who had been hiding in nearby bushes. As it turned out, the KGB had also intercepted Tolkachev's meeting schedule with the CIA and it was in fact the KGB that had given the signal to the CIA by opening the apartment window. The whole thing was a KGB trap. The package the case officer was carrying for Tolkachev was opened and recorded on video. The case officer was released at 12.20 a.m. after being detained at 9.40 p.m. The case officer and his family were forced to leave the country the week following the arrest. On the 8th of June 1985, some days prior to Stombau's arrest, Tolkachev and his wife Natasha had been enjoying some time away at their dacha. By this time, Tolkachev had already been compromised and the KGB searched his home while he and his wife were away, 
discovering the L pill he had left behind and no doubt other incriminating evidence of his spying activities. While en route to visit friends on the 9th of June 1985, Tolkachev and his wife encountered a police roadblock. Such things were not unusual in Moscow, but were seldom seen outside of the city. Tolkachov exited the car, and when approaching the traffic police checkpoint, was suddenly accosted from behind and grabbed by KGB agents. A rag, presumably drenched in chloroform, was held to his mouth and he was hustled into the back of a waiting van. He was searched and then driven to Lefortovo, the KGB's notorious prison in Moscow. Before the CIA even knew it, its most valuable operation was over. There are various theories floating about as to who gave away Tolkachev's secret identity, but two names crop up repeatedly, Aldrich Ames and Edward Lee Howard. Aldrich Ames is a former CIA officer turned KGB double agent who is serving a life sentence after being convicted of espionage against the United States in 1994. He is known to have compromised many highly classified CIA agents, including during 1985 immediately prior to Tolkachev's arrest. Edward Lee Howard is another former CIA officer, believed also to have compromised Tolkachev to the KGB. Howard was made aware of the Tolkachev operation in 1983 and was being prepared for a planned assignment to Moscow that summer. However, Howard was dismissed from his position in 1983 following a security investigation. According to Soviet defector Vitaly Yurchenko, Howard contacted the KGB in Austria in September 1984 and began providing information on CIA operations and their agents. In 1986, Soviet news agency TASS reported of Tolkachev's arrest, trial, conviction, and execution. The details of the trial are sketchy as they were seldom reported on in the Soviet Union. It is said that Tolkachev was convicted of high treason in the form of spying and was sentenced to death after his appeal was dismissed. Executions in the Soviet Union were normally carried out by firing squad, and it is thought that this was Tolkachev's fate. The information provided by Tolkachev over the approximate six years that he operated as a spy for the USA was extremely valuable and was exploited by a small, highly compartmented task force until around 1990, even after his arrest in 1985. Following Tolkachev's arrest, his wife Natasha was also prosecuted on the basis that she had known about his spying activities. She refused to denounce her husband and was sentenced to three years in a Soviet labor camp. Natasha was released after two years under a broad amnesty. She returned to Moscow, but died of ovarian cancer on the 31st of March 1991. She had appealed to the USA for medical help, but this went unanswered. America apparently did not recognize her for who she was, the wife of their former most valuable asset. Oleg, Tolkachev's son, remained in Moscow and to this day is a prominent architect. Whether you regard Tolkachev as a hero or a traitor, there is no denying how effective he was as a spy absolutely achieving his aims of inflicting the most amount of damage to the Soviet Union in as short a time as possible. His refusal to agree an exfiltration plan seems to suggest that Tolkachev may have accepted that the path he had chosen for himself left him living on borrowed time. He was singular in his purpose and determination, and will by the Western intelligence agencies be remembered as the billion dollar spy. My dear sir, I request that you pass the following to the appropriate authorities of the United States of America. It is your good friend who is turning to you, a friend who has already become your soldier warrior for the cause of truth. I have consciously embarked upon this path of struggle. I wish to make my contribution to our mutual cause as your soldier. These are selected excerpts from a letter penned by Colonel Oleg Vladimirovich Penkovsky and handed to two American student visitors on Moskvoretsky Bridge in Moscow on the 12th of August 1960. It was a moment that would forever alter the course of the Cold War. The letter would be handed in by one of the American students to the American Embassy in Moscow and would eventually make its way to MI6 and the CIA. Colonel Penkovsky was a senior military intelligence officer working for the GRU in the Soviet Union. A joint operation between the CIA and MI6 was established, and Penkovsky would for the next 18 months supply top-secret Soviet documents and information to the West. 
Few names have been as mythologized as that of Oleg Penkovsky. According to popular lore and even mainstream media, he is the spy who saved the world. In recent years, newly declassified information and the testimony of those involved in the Penkovsky operation on both sides of the Iron Curtain have told a somewhat different tale. Some now believe that Penkovsky was in fact a genocidal maniac and a self-aggrandizer. Far from helping to avert a global nuclear conflict, he nearly provoked one. As is often the case in matters of espionage, the facts are murky and the records incomplete. So what then is the truth about the spy they say saved the world? Born into an upper-middle-class professional family in the Caucasian city of Orzhonikidze on the 23rd of April 1919, Penkovsky's early life was shaped by his family's service to the Tsar. His grandfather was a respected judge in Stavropol, and his father was a first lieutenant in the White Army. Just a few months after Penkovsky's birth, his father disappeared without a trace. The fact that Penkovsky came from a noble line would present a major obstacle to his career development. He knew that his heritage posed a danger not only to his career prospects, but possibly to his life as well under the communist regime. And so did his best to hide it, telling all who asked that his father had died of typhus in 1919. As a youth, Penkovsky, like all good Russian boys, joined the Komsomol Soviet Youth Organization. In 1939, he graduated from artillery school in Kiev, and during his time serving in World War II, he fought in Poland and Finland. Penkovsky became the protégé of Lieutenant General Dmitry Gapanovich, whose daughter Vera he would marry a few years later. Like many of his counterparts, Penkovsky thought that in 1943, the war was about to reach its end. This was a concern for Penkovsky, who was fueled by his career ambitions. He had not yet been awarded any medals and knew he needed some decoration in order to progress his career post-war. He voluntarily went to the Ukrainian front where he served under Chief Marshal of Soviet Artillery, Sergei Varantsov. This was the second powerful man who would impact Penkovsky's life enormously. Both Penkovsky and Varantsov were injured in 1944, and during their time back in Moscow, Penkovsky became like a son to his general. After the war, Penkovsky married Vera Gapanovich, and with the help of Marshal Varantsov, studied at the Frunze Military Academy from 1945 to 1948. In 1949, he enrolled in the prestigious Military Diplomatic Academy, the breeding ground for promising intelligence agents, and from where he would graduate in 1953. Penkovsky emerged from the academy with a bright future ahead of him. He was well-educated and supported by the upper echelons of the Communist Party. Remarkably, Penkovsky was promoted to colonel at the young age of 30. Thereafter, he joined the Glavno Razvedivatelno Upravlenie, known as the GRU, which was the Soviet military's intelligence branch. However, in 1960, a misstep during his only international assignment in Turkey as deputy resident in Ankara would derail his career and catalyze his fall from grace. While in Turkey, the KGB discovered that Penkovsky's father had fought for the White Army against the Bolshevik revolutionaries no record of his death could be found, and the Soviet authorities suspected that he may have fled to the West. In Soviet Russia, the cardinal sins of the father truly did pass down from one generation to the next. After being questioned by the KGB, Penkovsky knew that he would never be trusted again. Shortly after his questioning, he was forced into subordination. Penkovsky was demoted and a new GRU resident was installed in his place. Disgruntled and embarrassed, it was around this time that Penkovsky first began to plot against the Soviet regime. He made an anonymous call from a phone booth to Turkish counterintelligence, which led to the arrest and expulsion from Turkey of a Russian intelligence officer. Penkovsky then sent an official cable of complaint to Moscow through KGB channels, blaming the newly installed GRU resident for the agent's compromise. The betrayal worked in the sense that the GRU resident was recalled to Moscow. However, Penkovsky's tattletailing to the KGB, a rival intelligence agency, caused great embarrassment to the GRU. It wasn't long before Penkovsky himself was recalled. Penkovsky's career came to a standstill 
as he was distrusted by both GRU and KGB officers alike. He was placed on the agency's reserve list and blocked from further international deployment. Eventually, Penkovsky was forced to accept a lower assignment as Deputy Chief of the State Committee for the Coordination of Scientific Technical Matters Foreign Section. This was the organization responsible for managing Soviet scientific and technical literature and making international contacts in scientific fields. To add insult to injury, Penkovsky was told that he would be discharged in 1962 once he completed his 25 years of service. This was the last straw for Penkovsky. Disgruntlement over the stagnation of his career and the resentment he felt towards the Soviet regime boiled over into fully-fledged treason. It was in 1960 that Penkovsky made his approach to the two American students on the bridge in Moscow. Penkovsky had been observing students Eldon Ray Cox and Henry Lee from afar for some time. He believed they were free of any formal surveillance and were his best bet at making contact with America. After approaching the two students, Penkovsky said that he had secret information about the recent downing by the Soviet military of an American U-2 spy plane piloted by Gary Powers on the 1st of May 1960. The US government claimed that the plane was a civilian weather observation craft, but after Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev revealed that pilot Gary Powers had been captured alive, US President Eisenhower's administration had to embarrassingly admit that the plane had been engaged in espionage in Soviet airspace. Penkovsky continued, telling the students that the plane had not been brought down by a single missile from a Russian MiG fighter, but that 14 air-to-air -air and ground-to-air missiles had been fired at the plane. One missile exploded near enough to the U-2 aircraft to cause it to spin out of control and crash. The Russians had taken out one of their own MiG-19 fighters in the process, killing the pilot. However, before Penkovsky felt that he had convinced the Americans of his integrity, two policemen walked by and they had to part ways. Before doing so, Penkovsky thrust two envelopes into Eldon's hands, which he implored him to deliver to the American embassy on his behalf. Henry was skeptical. His concern was that the Russians' approach was a provocation designed to get them kicked out of Russia. Eldon, on the other hand, was convinced that their encounter had been genuine. He immediately delivered the envelopes to the American embassy. There, they were opened and read, with the information promptly being passed on to the CIA. Penkovsky's letter included the names of 60 students enrolled at the Military Diplomatic Academy. The list indicated the countries the students were intended to be deployed to. On its own, this was incredibly valuable intelligence to the CIA and was included by Penkovsky to establish his bona fides. Penkovsky also included very specific instructions for a dead drop to communicate further. The CIA's first job was to identify who the mystery Russian man was. His letter was written anonymously, but contained enough clues to create a trail of breadcrumbs leading to Penkovsky. One of these crumbs was a photograph of three men, with the face of the man in the middle having been cut out and the words I am inscribed above it. The American students would later both pick out Penkovsky from among 15 photographs of various Russian men shown to them during their interviews. Once the letter's author was identified, the debate was sparked among the CIA about whether Penkovsky was genuine. Could this be a KGB dangle? Was he under Soviet control or could he be trusted? At the time, Penkovsky was the most senior Soviet intelligence officer to potentially operate for the West as a double agent. This was a golden but risky opportunity for the CIA and MI6 to gain a foothold in Moscow and a rare advantage over their Soviet counterparts. Many within the CIA were skeptical of Penkovsky's offer. It seemed so unlikely that a committed Communist Party member like Penkovsky would defect to the West. It was also implausible that the KGB would have been unaware of Penkovsky's activities, given how closely they monitored both their own people and foreigners. The risk of Penkovsky being a dangle was high. However, after examining the sensitive information Penkovsky had already provided, the CIA decided that this was an opportunity worth pursuing. The CIA had no active operatives in Moscow at the time, and so in October 1960, and without permission, sent an inexperienced CIA officer, codenamed Compass, to attempt to make further contact with Penkovsky. 
Due to the young agent's lack of field experience, his penchant for alcoholism and the operation's extreme sensitivity, he was unable to initiate contact with Penkovsky during his 10 months in Moscow. Compass barely left his hotel room, and the best he could suggest for a dead drop was for him and Penkovsky to hurl packages at each other over the hotel wall. Compass also failed at making telephone contact with Penkovsky, calling an hour late and speaking such poor Russian that Penkovsky simply hung up the telephone. Meanwhile, and given that some months had passed since his approach to the Americans on the bridge, Penkovsky considered that his letter had not been delivered. He would go on to approach other foreigners he encountered in the course of his work. This included in December 1960, when he approached Dr. Arthur Merriman in his hotel room during a trade delegation. He begged him to help, imploring him to hand two envelopes to the Americans. Merriman refused to touch the documents, believing Penkovsky's approach to be a KGB provocation. Nevertheless, Merriman informed MI6 of his interaction with Penkovsky. It is at this point of the story that we must be introduced to Greville Wynne. Wynne was a 41-year-old British businessman and an industrial sales consultant who regularly travelled through Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union as a representative of British electrical and steel companies. Wynne had become acquainted with Dickie Franks, who, unbeknownst to Wynne, was an MI6 agent and was looking to recruit. During a lunch meeting at the Ivy in London, Franks revealed to Wynne that he worked for MI6 and that he needed some help. Wynne's exact involvement with MI6 through the years is somewhat murky. His personality was said to be peppery and emotional, which, while making him likeable, also made him unpredictable. Wynne was asked to arrange a meeting with Penkovsky in Moscow and to act as a courier, receiving intelligence from him and carrying it back to London to be shared between the Joint CIA and MI6 task force. Wynne accepted the assignment and so, in April 1961, travelled to Moscow. This time he was there not only as a businessman, but as an agent for MI6. His objective was to arrange a Russian trade delegation to visit London. Penkovsky would be one of the delegates, giving MI6 an opportunity to spend time alone with him. Penkovsky was himself not blind to the opportunity a trip to London presented, but couldn't wait until then to share more secret information with the West. On the 6th of April 1961, Penkovsky visited Wynne in his hotel room, retrieving documents he had sewn into his trousers. Wynne was reluctant to take the documents, but agreed nevertheless. Greville Wynne's mission was a success, and a plan for a Russian trade delegation to visit London was arranged. In April 1961, Oleg Penkovsky had his first meetings with Western intelligence in a hotel room in London. Over a period of two days, he presented two packets of handwritten notes and documents to four intelligence officers. It was, however, at the London meeting that Penkovsky revealed the true motivations for his decision to spy for the West. He was ambitious and wanted fame and recognition. He asked for a rank in the United States and British militaries and to personally meet US President John F. Kennedy and Queen Elizabeth II. He made clear that he wanted to be remembered as the greatest spy in the world when he eventually defected to the West. Of course, he also wanted to be handsomely rewarded for his efforts. He had in mind to clear his debts, buy a new Volga motor car and purchase a second country home known in Russia as a dacha. Penkovsky revealed that his intention was not only to spy against the Soviet regime, but to destroy it. He had carefully planned out a bizarre plan that involved the planting of one kiloton nuclear bombs at key centers of the Soviet military across the USSR. His plan was to take out the Soviet Union's ability to retaliate in one fell swoop and pave the way for a new regime to take over after the fallout. There was another aspect of Penkovsky's character that was alarming, which was, despite being married to Vera, his penchant for entertaining cocktail bar hostesses and frequenting prostitutes. The morality of his activities aside, this also presented a security risk. Penkovsky indulged himself while in London, including spending time with a 23-year-old young lady named Zeph when visiting a club one evening. Greville Wynne would later be reminded of this encounter in a way that he never expected. Nevertheless, the secret information that Penkovsky revealed during his two days with the CIA and MI6 in London was nothing short of an intelligence windfall. Penkovsky detailed the structure of the GRU and shed light on the development of the Sputnik satellite and Yuri Gagarin's first launch into space. 
Even while Penkovsky sat with Western intelligence, dramatic events of the Cold War were playing out. The US launched its abortive Bay of Pigs invasion in Cuba at midnight on the 17th of April 1961. The 1400 Cuban exiles trained by CIA operatives landed on the southern coast of the island, where they encountered unexpected heavy resistance. By the 20th of April, the invasion was over, with the exiles either being killed or captured by Cuban armed forces. The US could hardly deny its involvement, and the embarrassment of the Kennedy regime was only overshadowed by the risk of nuclear war the debacle almost set off. As regards the Berlin crisis, tensions were escalating over the unresolved status of Berlin post-World War II. The USA, Britain and France controlled West Germany and West Berlin, and the Soviet Union controlled East Germany and East Berlin. The tenuous truce was threatened by the entirety of Berlin falling within Soviet-controlled East Germany. Those in the East were fleeing to the West due to deteriorating conditions in the communist-aligned DDR. Penkovsky said that, as usual, Khrushchev was barking very loudly, but was probably unwilling to bite on the Berlin question. Until that point, the West believed that the Berlin crisis was likely to lead to World War III. The intelligence Penkovsky provided is believed to have aided Kennedy in navigating the crisis without a need for nuclear escalation. Penkovsky also said that he knew from Varantsov that the Soviet Union was not as far ahead of the US in the arms race as Khrushchev liked to boast. In fact, the USSR was behind in the development and building of intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs. Initially viewed with skepticism, Penkovsky's claims would later be verified by other intelligence sources which suggested that the so-called missile gap between the US and the Soviet Union was non-existent. If anything, America was ahead in the race. For this reason, the advice from Penkovsky was that Kennedy could be firm with Khrushchev on the Cuba question without risking nuclear war. This would later prove true during the Cuban Missile Crisis, which loomed just around the corner. Back in the hotel room in London, the CIA and MI6 team had to make arrangements for Penkovsky to continue meeting with Greville Wynne when he was in Moscow. The meetings would have to be infrequent to avoid suspicion, and so it was agreed that, for the most part, information exchanges would take place using dead drops. Western agents would also attempt to speak with Penkovsky at diplomatic cocktail parties. Other means of communication included via shortwave radio to be smuggled into Moscow by Wynn, and only if absolutely necessary over the telephone. Penkovsky was also provided with a Minox camera and 20 rolls of film which he intended to use at the Soviet Ministry of Defense libraries to photograph secret manuals, journals and other classified documents. Penkovsky's short time in London came to an end. He would return to Moscow on the 6th of May 1961, where his commitment to spy for the West would be put to the test. By the time Penkovsky had left London, those handling his operation were convinced of his good faith and that the wealth of information he had already provided was genuine. Penkovsky wasted no time in using the Minox camera. Under the pretense of writing an article on nuclear strategy for a military journal, he was granted the passes required to access materials in the special collection of the Artillery Command Library. Greville Wynne would arrive on the 27th of May 1961 for a French trade fair and met with Penkovsky to collect three rolls of undeveloped film. The volume of information that Penkovsky provided to the West would become so great that a dedicated task force was later established to process it all. Intelligence reports were structured to suggest multiple sources. This reinforced the illusion of credibility and provided an additional layer of protection for Penkovsky. Intelligence supplied by Penkovsky was given two names by the CIA. Chickadee was intelligence containing Penkovsky's own opinions or personal observations, and Ironbark was quantifiable or scientific information, such as top-secret field manuals and military journals. Penkovsky himself was codenamed Hero. It was decided that Janet Chisholm, codenamed Anne, would be Penkovsky's routine contact in Moscow for delivering intelligence. She was a mother of three and wife to Rory Chisholm, who worked for MI6 in Moscow. Janet was not a professional intelligence officer, and expecting her to operate as Penkovsky's go-between in Moscow was borderline insane. But this was one of those situations so crazy that Penkovsky's handlers thought it just might work. As a woman, and not known by the KGB to be working for MI6, 
It was thought that she would not be surveilled, or at least not to the same extent as others working at the American Embassy. In June of 1961, a brush exchange was arranged between Janet and Penkovsky in a park adjacent to Zvetnoy Boulevard in Moscow. Janet sat on a bench along with her infant in a pram and her older children beside her. As agreed, Penkovsky offered the older children vitamin C sweets commonly eaten by Russian children. Janet took the box, deftly exchanging it for an identical one she was carrying. The box was switched and the two parted ways. The brush contact was successfully completed. The box of sweets contained seven rolls of undeveloped film and two typewritten sheets of paper. The papers contained, among others, details of the ongoing Berlin crisis and Khrushchev's intention to sign a treaty with East Germany, with or without Britain, France and the US. It was this inside information that informed Kennedy's firm response to Khrushchev's aggression. Although the Berlin Wall went up on the 13th of August 1961, the crisis which threatened global peace was averted by that October thanks in part to information supplied by Penkovsky. Suspicions about Penkovsky's intelligence were consistently being voiced by the CIA. Director Alan Dulles said that he suspected Penkovsky was trying to get the West into a war with the Soviet Union. Ironically, it was the excellent quality of the photographs Penkovsky provided that increased suspicions. He would later be put through a photography test by the CIA at their next in-person meeting to assess whether Penkovsky really was taking the photographs himself. As it turned out, he was just really good at it. All the trouble taken to obscure the source of the intelligence being provided and to protect Agent Hero's identity made the CIA's next decision all the more bizarre. In order to allay the doubts of those receiving the Chickadee and Ironbark intelligence, the CIA's Soviet Russia division circulated an anonymous operational history of Agent Hero on the 18th of July, 1961. The memo contained enough detail for any half-astute CIA or MI6 mole to identify Penkovsky as the source, and as the rest of this story unfolds, it is entirely possible that this is exactly what happened. Penkovsky arrived back in London for another trade fair the same day in July that the CIA circulated its operational memo about him. Greville Wynne coordinated in-person meetings with his handlers where further and extensive intelligence was provided. A trade fair in Paris in September 1961 allowed for additional in-person meetings. It was here that Penkovsky again revealed that aspect of his character that so worried his handlers. He suggested that the West should consider assassinating Nikita Khrushchev arguing that the Soviet leader was the atomic version of Hitler and should be stopped at all costs. As global tensions over Berlin and the newly constructed Berlin Wall continued to escalate, it was agreed that an emergency signal was needed to allow Penkovsky to warn Western intelligence at short notice should he learn of Soviet plans to deliver a nuclear first strike on American or British soil. Codenamed Distant, the emergency signal was intended to be used in three specific situations all of which related to possible nuclear threats. In the most serious case of an imminent attack, when the number he called was answered, he would not speak, but instead breathe three times into the receiver, then hang up. The procedure would be repeated a minute later. This would signal that he intended to load a dead drop containing intelligence supporting his belief of an imminent nuclear strike. To confirm that he had loaded the drop, he would make a black mark on a lamppost on Kutuzovsky Prospect. After he left Paris, Penkovsky's desire to be the greatest spy in the world led him to redouble his activity. Over a period of three months between October 1961 and January 1962, Penkovsky met with Chisholm in public locations 11 times, passing a total of 35 rolls of undeveloped film. The CIA, who by that stage was primarily driving the operation, wanted Penkovsky to slow down. The sheer quantity of secret information he was collecting and the number of meetings that were required were putting the operation at risk of compromise. During a brush contact meeting on the 5th of January 1962, Penkovsky spotted a brown saloon that he suspected was conducting surveillance. He met with Chisholm on two occasions thereafter, but then suddenly did not appear for an arranged meeting on the 20th of February 1962. He only reappeared on the 28th of March. While Penkovsky would later reappear and deliver further rolls of film and other intelligence, it was decided by the CIA to put the Penkovsky operation on hold for several months. 
Penkovsky and Chisholm would only meet again on the 31st of May 1962. This time, Penkovsky had bad news. The KGB was still delving into his past and had been unable to find his father's grave. As a result, he was not permitted to travel abroad anymore. From this point on, the entirety of the Penkovsky operation would have to be run from within Moscow. On the 2nd of July 1962, Greville Wynne travelled to Moscow to discuss international trade opportunities. While Penkovsky provided further intelligence, he appeared nervous and under pressure. A dinner meeting on the 4th of July had to be abandoned after Penkovsky detected that Wynne was being followed. It seemed that the KGB net was finally closing in. Wynne made sure to leave Russia the very next day. The timing of all this was inopportune, for the Cold War was nearing boiling point. On the 8th of June 1962, Nikita Khrushchev unveiled his secret plan to the Soviet Presidium to transform the island of Cuba into a staging area for his nuclear missiles. By July, the US had noticed that the Soviet Union was up to something sinister in the Caribbean. On the 10th of August 1962, Photographs taken by U-2 spy planes and intelligence reports revealed to the CIA that cargo ship movements from the Baltic and Black Seas to Cuba had increased significantly. Then, on the 14th of October, U-2 pilot Major Richard Heiser managed to capture high-resolution photographs of what appeared to be missiles too long to be defensive munitions. One of the key items of intelligence that Penkovsky had provided were photographs of the manual for the Soviet's R-12 medium-range ballistic missile. The CIA's photography center compared Heiser's aerial reconnaissance photographs to the image provided by Penkovsky. It was determined that the photographed missiles were in fact the Soviet R-12 missiles. On the 22nd of October 1962, John F. Kennedy shocked the world by revealing that unmistakable evidence of a nuclear threat in Cuba had been identified and imposed a quarantine around the island. Ultimately, war was averted, with Khrushchev dismantling and removing the missiles from Cuba and Kennedy agreeing to remove U.S. missiles from Turkey. At the most crucial time, when the U.S. wanted to hear from Penkovsky about the developing situation in Cuba, he went dark. Worse still, Wynne was suspected to have been compromised and thus removed from the operation. Just as the dust was settling from the Cuban Missile Crisis, two phone calls received by Western intelligence threatened to again send the world into the nuclear abyss. On the 2nd of November 1962, the CIA and the MI6 each received a telephone call. The caller blew three short breaths into the mouthpiece, then promptly hung up. This was the emergency signal Penkovsky was to give in the event of him learning of an imminent nuclear strike by the Soviet Union. A decision had to be made about what to do with this information. By this stage, just about all of Western intelligence believed that Penkovsky had been compromised. It just wasn't known whether he was still at large or under the control of the KGB. The agent receiving the call at MI6 chose not to report it, whereas at the CIA the message was sent up the chain of command. The signal was deemed too dangerous by the CIA to ignore, for if it was real, the West likely only had hours to avert a nuclear catastrophe. A CIA agent was sent to check the lamppost on Kutuzovsky Prospect for a black mark indicating that Penkovsky had filled the dead drop, but none could be seen. It was decided to check the dead drop site anyway, just in case. Junior CIA officer Richard Jacob was recruited for the job. He went to the designated drop site at a building on Pushkinskaya Street. Upon checking, he saw that a matchbox had been placed in the drop. Just as he was about to retrieve the matchbox, the members of a KGB team hiding in the shadows pounced on him. Jacob was bundled into a KGB Volga and whisked away to a nearby Militia station for interrogation. He was shortly thereafter declared persona non grata and expelled from Russia. It was now abundantly clear that the Penkovsky operation had reached its disastrous end. A few days later, Greville Wynne was arrested in Budapest while attending a trade fair and was transported back to Moscow. During his interrogation, Wynne offered to turn double agent and work for the Soviet Union, an offer that was not taken up. On the 11th of December 1962, the world received news of Penkovsky's arrest via TASS, the Soviet News Bureau. Penkovsky had been arrested at his home some weeks before, on the 22nd of October 1962, by KGB Special Forces. 
Later documents and testimony of those involved would reveal that during his interrogation, Penkovsky offered to turn triple agent, saying that he could still be of use to the Soviet Union. This offer, much like Wynne's, was turned down. It was announced six months later that Penkovsky and Wynne would be tried for espionage and treason at a public trial that was to start on the 7th of May, 1963. At the trial, Wynne, realizing that he did not have diplomatic immunity to rely on, turned on MI6 in an attempt to save himself. And who could blame him, given the life prospects that lay before him at that moment? He claimed that his involvement as a courier in the operation was minimal and that he had been duped and cajoled by Western intelligence to perform a role he neither understood nor wanted. By the time Penkovsky took the stand at his show trial, his fate had of course already been decided. Penkovsky admitted to spying against his nation and while he revealed many details of his involvement with Western intelligence, he withheld just as much. The Soviet prosecution downplayed Penkovsky's spying and the secrets he disclosed to the West, focusing instead on his moral failings. He was painted as a degenerate womanizer and a greedy alcoholic. Traits, it was said, that sent him into the welcoming arms of the West. The trial lasted four days, at the end of which both men were convicted. Greville Wynne was sentenced to eight years, three of which were to be served in prison, with the remaining five spent in a labor camp. Fortunately for Wynne, he would see freedom about six months later after he was swapped in a prisoner exchange for Gordon Lonsdale, also known as Russian spy Conan Molody. Wynne would later go on to write his memoirs which couldn't be trusted as far as they could be thrown. He told demonstrably false stories about working for MI5 during World War II, as well as other fibs about his involvement in the Penkovsky operation. Penkovsky was sentenced to death on the 11th of May 1963, Five days later, he was executed at Butyrskaya prison by firing squad. It has long been rumored that he was not shot, but in fact burned alive in a crematorium, the gruesome scene being video recorded as a warning to GRU and KGB recruits. This was always denied by the Soviet authorities, and there is little to suggest that it actually happened. After the trial, so many questions remained unanswered. For how long had Penkovsky been operating while compromised? Had he been acting as a triple agent all along, and had the CIA and MI6 been fed false information? During Wynne's interrogation, a tape was played of a conversation he had with Penkovsky. In the recording, Penkovsky could be heard asking, and how is Zepp? This was actually a reference to Zeph, the bar girl Penkovsky had met in a London nightclub in May 1961. This means that the KGB had Penkovsky under surveillance just a few short weeks after his first meetings with the CIA and MI6 in London. For 16 months, the KGB knew of Penkovsky's treason, yet did not arrest him. They even allowed him to travel to London and later Paris, only preventing his travel abroad in October 1961. Shortening the leash in this way served to reduce the time Penkovsky could spend with his handlers and forced him to meet his contacts in Moscow. This provided an excuse for the KGB to place him under routine surveillance. The KGB has always claimed that it was the ordinary monitoring of Penkovsky's movements that led them to discover his treason, but many doubt that this is true. Another theory is that the KGB allowed Penkovsky to continue spying for the West because it needed to hide the existence of the source that exposed him. This source must have been of incredibly high value given the secret nature of the intelligence leaked by Penkovsky. The KGB, so the theory goes, controlled and fed some of the information that Penkovsky had access to, turning him into an unwitting Soviet agent of disinformation. While the KGB's source has never been confirmed, one name that comes up repeatedly is George Blake. He was an agent for MI6 turned Soviet spy. Becoming a communist during the 1950s Korean War, his espionage against MI6 was only detected in 1961. He was arrested and later sentenced to 42 years in prison. His position at the time of the Penkovsky operation and the people he knew and worked with, including Greville Wynne and the Chisholms, point to him as a possible candidate for the KGB source. The CIA's former chief historian, Benjamin Fisher, published his research into the Penkovsky case in 2021. In Fisher's view, Penkovsky was never in a position to know about Khrushchev's nuclear plans and strategy. While acknowledging that Penkovsky provided the manual for the SS-4 missile, Fisher contends that his contribution to US intelligence and policymaking is exaggerated, distorted, and in several instances falsified. 
In the aftermath of the Penkovsky case, the CIA made the unprecedented decision to publish the Penkovsky Papers. This book exposed the operational aspects of the GRU as revealed by Penkovsky. The book was a bestseller, offering Westerners a glimpse into Soviet intelligence operations in the West. But Fisher believes that the Penkovsky Papers only served to fuel the myth of Penkovsky being the savior of the West. But what of the telephone signals received by the CIA and MI6 immediately prior to Richard Jacobs' arrest at the dead drop site? Those signals were part of the distant communication plan and only to be used if Penkovsky learned of an imminent nuclear strike. When the signals were given, Penkovsky had already been arrested. The only reasonable conclusion is that the KGB learned of Penkovsky's communication strategy and gave the false signals. But why would the KGB do this? if giving the signals could lead to a nuclear first strike by the West? As soon as he was caught, Penkovsky would have known his life was effectively over. One theory suggests that Penkovsky intentionally misled his interrogators, telling them that the signal was to be given if he was in unexpected danger. He may well have decided that he would try to take the whole world down with him. In London, Penkovsky clearly revealed his vendetta against the Soviet Union and his desire to destroy it, no matter the cost. His suggestion to hide and detonate nuclear warheads across Russia and assassinate Khrushchev is a testament to this. Is it true that Penkovsky tried to destroy the world? He certainly was motivated by personal ambition and a desire for vengeance, but was this enough for him to attempt to spark a global conflict? Much of the information that might reveal the full story is unfortunately buried in the KGB archives and unlikely to ever see the light of day. Although it cannot be determined with absolute certainty how much of what Penkovsky provided was genuine, there is no doubt that his contribution had a dramatic impact on Western intelligence during a crucial time in world history. Whatever the truth may be, Colonel Oleg Penkovsky will forever be remembered as the spy who saved the world. What motivates a person to become a spy and betray their own country? For some, it's a matter of principle and ideology, a belief in a cause that supersedes national loyalty. For others, it's all about the money, the allure of wealth proving stronger than any patriotic duty. Aldrich Rick Ames, a former CIA officer turned KGB mole, fell firmly into the latter category. Driven by greed and the demands of an extravagant second wife who lived well beyond her means, Ames embarked on a nine-year path of treachery that would lead to the arrest or death of no less than ten of the US's highest-ranking spies. The aftermath of his near-decade-long spying spree was immense, with the US government recognizing it as the most disastrous failure of intelligence in the nation's history. This is the story of the notorious CIA mole who shook American intelligence to its very foundations. Born in the tranquil town of River Falls, Wisconsin, on the 26th of May, 1941, Aldrich Ames was the firstborn of Carlton Cecil and Rachel Ames. His father was a respected college lecturer, and his mother was a high school English teacher. Aldrich, the eldest of three and the only son, was destined for a life far removed from quiet academia. In 1952, Aldrich's father joined the CIA's Directorate of Operations, uprooting the family to Virginia. A year later, the family was whisked away to Southeast Asia for a three-year stint. However, Carlton's career was marred by a severe struggle with alcoholism, leading to a damning performance appraisal and a stagnant career. Aldrich, meanwhile, began his association with the CIA as early as his sophomore year in high school in 1957, when he took up a summer job as a records analyst. His ambition, however, lay in studying foreign cultures and history, a dream he started pursuing in 1959 at the University of Chicago. But a deep-seated passion for drama and the arts distracted Aldrich from his studies, resulting in poor grades and an unfinished sophomore year. In the summer of 1960, Aldrich returned to the CIA, this time as a laborer and painter. He then dabbled in the world of theatre in Chicago, working as an assistant technical director. But by February 1962, the allure of the CIA drew him back to Washington. He resumed his clerical duties, marking the beginning of his full-time employment with the agency, a path that would ultimately lead him down a road to infamy. 
Five years into his tenure at the CIA, Ames graduated with a bachelor's degree in history from George Washington University. He hadn't initially envisioned a lifelong career with the agency, but his steady climb up the ranks and commendable performance appraisals led him to the career trainee program. In 1969, Ames's personal and professional lives intertwined when he married his first wife, Nancy Segerbath, a fellow CIA officer he had met in the trainee program. Soon after his marriage, he was posted to Ankara in Turkey with his new wife, where his role was to recruit Soviet intelligence officers for the CIA. He managed to infiltrate the Revolutionary Youth Federation of Turkey, a Marxist-Leninist organization. While this was no small feat, his performance while on assignment was deemed generally to be merely satisfactory. His assessor recorded that Ames was introverted and devoid of interpersonal skills, that he had developed an indifferent attitude toward his work, and that he should be reassigned to analytical work. This appraisal left Ames contemplating a departure from the CIA and quite possibly influenced his later decision to betray his country. Returning to CIA headquarters in Virginia in 1972, Ames spent the next four years in the Soviet East European Division, where he was put in charge of all Soviet and Eastern European operations conducted in Europe. His performance reviews were generally positive, as he excelled in managing paperwork and planning field operations. However, just like his father before him, his excessive drinking became a recurring issue, leading to two confidential memos being placed in his file. In 1976, Ames was assigned to New York City, where he handled two significant Soviet assets. By this stage in his career, Ames had become a specialist in his knowledge of the KGB. While working in New York, he received his most favorable performance appraisals, resulting in several promotions and bonuses. However, his lackadaisical approach to financial accounting and a couple of serious security violations marred his record, including an incident in which he left a briefcase containing classified operational materials on a subway while en route to meet a Soviet asset. The briefcase was later recovered, but it was not known to what extent the classified information it contained had been compromised. Ames turned down a number of international assignments because his wife was reluctant to relocate, but he eventually realized that doing so jeopardized his career prospects at the agency. He thus, in 1981, accepted a posting to Mexico City where he believed he could stay in close contact with his wife who remained in New York. His performance in Mexico was said to be mediocre. He failed to gain a firm grasp on the Spanish language, and by the end of his assignment, none of his contacts became operational informants or spies. Ames's personal life during his time in Mexico was marked by infidelity to his wife and increased alcohol consumption, acquiring a reputation for taking long, boozy lunches. In one drunken episode, he found himself in a shouting match with a Cuban official at a diplomatic reception. In another, he caused a traffic accident and was too drunk to answer questions put to him by the police. With his wife back in New York, Ames, the now geographic bachelor, began in 1982 to have an affair with Maria del Rosario Casas Dupuy. She was a cultural attaché at the Colombian embassy and a minor CIA informant. To Ames, she had an exotic allure, but perhaps unbeknownst to him at first, an insatiable appetite for the extravagant. Designer clothing and high living were the order of the day, and Ames would soon realize he had bitten off far more than he could chew financially speaking. Despite CIA regulations and the relationship not being a secret, Ames failed to report his relationship with a foreign national to his superiors. In 1983, Ames was transferred back to Washington, where he, despite his mediocre performance record, was placed in the most sensitive element of the Department of Operations. Responsible for all Soviet counterintelligence, he had access to all CIA plans and operations against the KGB and the Soviet military intelligence, the GRU. Many have questioned why Ames was given such a high-profile position, and the answer seems to lie in the fact that the role he was given was not popular among operations officers who preferred to be on the street. The job favoured someone with an analytic bent, and thus was given to Ames. It was during this time that Rosario left Colombia to join Ames in Washington as his mistress. She immediately began to burn through his money at upscale restaurants and fashion boutiques. 
Between Rosario's wild spending habits and Ames's divorce from Nancy in 1983, he was left financially strained. Ames agreed to pay off the accumulated marital debts and provide monthly support to Nancy. It was this financial pressure that led Ames to consider espionage for the Soviet Union, and it wouldn't be long before Ames found an opportunity to make first contact. On the 16th of April, 1985, Ames made his first move. Under the guise of a CIA-sanctioned meeting with a Soviet embassy arms control specialist, Ames arranged to meet with Sergei Chuvakin for drinks at the Mayflower Hotel. Chuvakin, however, didn't pitch. After stealing himself with a few vodka martinis, Ames decided to take a walk across to the Soviet embassy, where he handed an envelope to the receptionist, whom he knew would be a KGB employee. The envelope was addressed to the local KGB chief, but inside was another envelope. Written on the face of the second envelope was the operational name of the KGB chief, known only to the KGB and a few select CIA and FBI personnel. This, Ames thought, was guaranteed to get the KGB's attention. Inside the second envelope were three documents carefully selected by Ames. The first gave the names of two Soviet intelligence officers who had secretly offered to work for the CIA. The second document was a page from a CIA personnel directory with Ames's name and title of chief, counterintelligence branch, highlighted yellow. The third document contained a request for $50,000 a sum he deemed reasonable compensation for the secret information he could share with the KGB. Chuvakin, the man who had stood him up, telephoned Ames three weeks later inviting him to a meeting at the Soviet embassy. Then followed a series of meetings between Ames and Chuvakin and the exchange of various sums of money. This marked the point of no return for Ames. He had crossed a line from which he could never retreat. Ames met several times in the summer of 1985 with a Russian diplomat to whom he began to reveal the identities of top-level CIA and FBI sources who were reporting on Soviet activities. He also spilt the beans on various CIA technical operations targeting the Soviet Union. At one such meeting, on the 13th of June, 1985, Ames disclosed the names of 24 Western intelligence spies to the Soviet Union. Immediately, the CIA's network of Soviet bloc agents began to disappear at an alarming rate. The Politburo and the KGB never made spying easy for Ames. Treason was considered by the Soviet Union as the ultimate crime, and just about as soon as Ames identified a CIA asset to his handlers, the Soviet traitor would be arrested, and more often than not, shot. The CIA's network of Soviet bloc agents thus suddenly began to disappear at an alarming rate. The agency was aware something was amiss, but the possibility of a mole within their ranks was too much for the agency's pride to contemplate. Was it possible that the CIA's own operatives had blundered their operations and thus compromised their agents? Or perhaps the secret premises at the American embassy in Moscow had been compromised or infiltrated? These alternative explanations were far less embarrassing and painful and were thus considered the most likely explanation. The refusal of the CIA to consider that their assets were being lost as a result of an inside job became known as Angleton Syndrome. It was called this after hyper-paranoid former CIA director James Angleton, whose zeal in detecting and expunging moles spanned a career and proved to be destructive and entirely counterproductive. It took a tip-off by Soviet defector Colonel Vitaly Yurchenko in the summer of 1985 to compel the CIA investigators to look inwards. The prime suspect was former CIA agent Edward Lee Howard, a man known to have been passing information onto the Soviets. For this reason, Ames was initially overlooked by the investigators. However, when three other significant assets about whom Howard could not have known were lost, it became clear that the information was being leaked from another source. In a strange twist, still not explained to this day, Yurchenko decided to return to the Soviet Union three months after defecting. Instead of receiving a bullet to the back of the head, he was welcomed with open arms by the KGB. The CIA was left scratching its head, wondering whether the tip-off was genuine. So, while the alarm bells were ringing and a mole hunt was underway, Ames managed to fly under the CIA and FBI radar. He took a trip to Bogota towards the end of 1985. There he took the opportunity to meet with a KGB officer named Vladimir Mechulayev, who became his primary handler for most of his spying career. 
In August 1985, and shortly after his divorce was finalised, Ames married Rosario. It had already become apparent to all and sundry that Ames was living well beyond his means. To explain his newfound wealth, he concocted a story about his wife's wealthy Colombian family. By 1986, the agency knew that as many as 30 CIA and FBI assets had been compromised. As each intelligence source fell off the map, Ames became more fearful that he would begin to be suspected by his agency. He voiced his concerns to the KGB, and its response was to step up its game of diversion and distraction. The KGB cleverly diverted U.S. investigators by suggesting that the mole was stationed at a secret CIA communications facility in Virginia. This led to a year-long investigation of 90 employees, none of whom were Ames. This was, however, just one of the ways in which the KGB threw the CIA off the scent, with numerous other false tip-offs being fed to the CIA via the KGB network. These diversions continued for years, allowing Ames to operate freely while the CIA and the FBI trod water. Despite his ongoing mediocre performance reviews and evidence of problematic drinking, Ames was posted to Rome in 1986. Just prior to his departure, Ames was confronted by one of his worst fears, a polygraph test. All CIA employees were obliged to take a lie detector test every five years. However, due to a massive backlog, it had been ten years since Ames had taken one. He was terrified when he learned of the test to be conducted a few weeks later. He immediately wrote to his KGB handlers to ask for their advice. Their response was simply for Ames to relax, get a good night's sleep, and take the test. On the 2nd of May 1986, Ames took his polygraph test. His test showed deceptive answers to some questions, including when he was asked whether he had been approached by any foreign intelligence services. The overly friendly and incompetent polygraph examiner nevertheless gave Ames a pass, saying that his answers were bright and direct. Ames no doubt breathed a heavy sigh of relief and packed his bags for Rome. Upon arriving in Italy, Ames was assigned as chief of the enemy targets branch, with his remit extending not only to Soviet targets, but also those in Eastern Europe, China and North Korea. In Rome, Ames continued his meetings with KGB agents, many of which took place at the Soviet housing complex. He handed over copious amounts of classified CIA documents in exchange for money and vodka. He was also given instructions for clandestine contacts once he returned to the US from his assignment in Italy. While in Italy, Ames needed to talk money with his handlers. Ames had initially been promised payment of $2 million in exchange for his services, with nothing further after that limit was reached. Ames managed to agree an additional fee of $10,000 per month. But all that cash became a problem for Ames. He was compelled to open a Swiss bank account through which he laundered the money. Each meeting with his KGB handlers was incredibly lucrative for Ames, with him pocketing between $20,000 to $50,000. The total amount of money received by Ames from the Soviet Union and Russia during his spying career is believed to be as much as $2.5 million. In the twilight of 1986, the CIA truly faced reality for the first time by acknowledging the very real possibility of a mole within its ranks. A team known as the Special Task Force was assembled to hunt down the mole leaking information to the Soviets. The team, led by Paul Redmond and including Jean Vertefeuille, Sandra Grimes, Diana Worthen and Dan Payne, began to investigate all the compromised operations to try and identify commonalities between them. 1986 was also the year that the CIA and FBI began to cooperate and share information. Ames returned to U.S. soil in 1989 and was assigned as chief of the European branch in the External Operations Group of the Soviet and East European Division based in Washington, D.C. This position gave him access to even more unique classified information that his KGB handlers would have been most interested in. Fortunately, Ames only held the position for a few months and was soon reassigned. Wherever Ames found himself within the agency, he busied himself by arranging dead drops of secret information for his KGB handlers, in exchange for which he continued to receive sums of money. In November 1989, an observant colleague reported that Ames seemed to be living a lifestyle far beyond the means of a CIA officer, and his claims about his wife's family's wealth were dubious. Diana Worthen, a member of the Mole Hunt team, had known Rosario before her marriage to Ames. 
During a casual conversation about home decor, Rosario's nonchalant disregard for price raised Worthen's suspicion. She also knew that Rosario's parents were not wealthy, but a CIA contact in Bogota reported a sudden improvement in their financial status. Despite these red flags, the CIA's response was sluggish. By 1990, the CIA was convinced of a mole's presence, but was still no closer to identifying the culprit. The recruitment of new Soviet agents ground to a near halt, as the agency's ability to protect its assets was in question. Ames was again transferred, this time to the Counter-Narcotics Center, or the CNC. By this stage, suspicions over the possibility of Ames being a mole were growing, and thus he was kept at the CNC for the remainder of his CIA career. Ames's access to top-secret information that would have been of interest to the Soviets was more limited in this role, and thus it was thought he could do less damage if he later proved to be a spy. As the spotlight began to shine on Ames, the investigative team began speaking to various of his colleagues and friends. What they learned was rather shocking. Some said they wouldn't have been surprised if Ames were a spy. It was said that he routinely disobeyed his bosses, left his office safe unlocked, received an unusually high number of calls from Soviet diplomats at work, and that he flaunted his unexplained wealth. Yet despite all this, the CIA's Office of Security decided that what they learned about Ames in the interviews wasn't worth pursuing. Ames nevertheless was obliged to submit to a second polygraph test in line with the agency's five-year rule. On the 12th of April 1991, Ames took his test, but this time failed miserably after being questioned about the source of his wealth. His unsatisfactory explanation was that his wife Rosario received an allowance from her wealthy family in Colombia, but the test showed that he was being deceptive. The CIA already knew that Rosario did not come from a wealthy background, yet inexplicably the polygraph operator who hadn't been told about the Ames investigation stood the test down. Thinking it was only a routine test, he thought that the test was generating false positives and told Ames to return a few days later to try again. This he did, and he passed with flying colours because there were no questions asked about his money. After reviewing his file, the CIA task team gave Ames a completely clean bill of health. For the time being, Ames believed the heat was off, but despite all the investigative bungling by the CIA, there were still good minds and dedicated professionals working tirelessly to uncover the truth. The CIA finally zeroed in on Ames when his colleagues and the task team began to take real notice of a significant improvement in his personal appearance and lifestyle. His previously yellowed teeth were now capped, and his attire had shifted from bargain basement to tailor-made suits that even his superiors couldn't afford. Despite his annual salary of $60,000, Ames was living a life of luxury. He owned a half-a-million-dollar house in an upmarket suburb in Arlington, Virginia, paid for in cash. He drove a luxury Jaguar and had spent tens of thousands of dollars on home remodeling and redecoration. His monthly phone bills exceeded $6,000, mostly due to calls made by his wife to her family in Colombia, and he held premium credit cards with minimum monthly payments that surpassed his monthly salary. After many wasted years of pursuing dead ends and diversions, the CIA task team finally brought Ames within the focus of their crosshairs. In the spring of 1993, the CIA and FBI launched an exhaustive investigation into Ames. FBI special agents and investigative specialists conducted intensive physical and electronic surveillance, sifted through his rubbish, and installed a tracking device in his car. For ten months, Ames was subjected to relentless surveillance. Searches of his home revealed documents and other evidence linking Ames to the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service. On the 13th of October 1993, investigators observed Ames making a chalk mark on a mailbox, a signal to the Russians of his intention to meet them in Bogota, Colombia. Ames was allowed to travel to Bogota in 1993, but was carefully and constantly observed. By the time he returned to the United States later that year, the investigative team had enough to justify a plan of arrest being approved by the authorities. When Ames was scheduled to attend a conference in Moscow in early 1994, the FBI decided they could wait no longer for fear that he may defect. On the 21st of February 1994, the net finally closed on 52-year-old Aldrich Ames. He was arrested outside his Arlington home. At the moment of his arrest, Ames protested, 
You're making a big mistake. You must have the wrong man. Minutes after Ames was taken into custody, Rosario was also arrested inside the residence. The following day, the Department of Justice formally charged Ames and Rosario with spying for the Soviet Union and Russia. On the 28th of April, Ames pleaded guilty and was sentenced to life imprisonment. As part of a plea deal negotiated by Ames, his wife received a five-year prison sentence for tax evasion and conspiracy to commit espionage. After Rosario's arrest, the FBI discovered a trove of luxury items in the Ames home, including 60 purses, over 500 pairs of shoes, and 165 unopened boxes of pantyhose. In court, Ames confessed to compromising virtually all Soviet agents of the CIA and other American and foreign services known to him. He admitted to providing the USSR and Russia with a vast amount of classified information. It is estimated that Ames's actions led to the compromise of at least a hundred American intelligence operations and the execution of at least ten sources. Moreover, Ames's betrayal of CIA methods allowed the KGB to use controlled agents to feed the US both genuine intelligence and disinformation from 1986 to 1993. Some of this feed material was incorporated into CIA intelligence reports, several of which even reached three presidents. Ames expressed that he was not afraid of being caught by the FBI or CIA, but was afraid of Soviet defectors, stating, Virtually every American who has been jailed in connection with espionage has been fingered by a Soviet source. Burning questions in Washington, how could it have taken so long? So long to arrest the highest ranking CIA officer ever accused of selling out to the Russians? The question no doubt screaming in your mind is, how could this have been allowed to happen and for it to drag on for so many years? Despite all the red flags, Ames was able to operate freely for nine years, almost single-handedly destroying US intelligence's entire Soviet and Russian operation. The CIA naturally faced massive criticism for not focusing on Ames sooner, given the noticeable improvement in his standard of living. There was an uproar in the American Congress when CIA Director James Woolsey decided that no one in the agency would be dismissed or demoted as a result of the handling of the years-long mole investigation. The US government went on to conduct an extensive investigation into the handling of the espionage case, with the Select Committees on Intelligence at both the Senate and House of Representatives publishing damning reports on what was described as the most devastating espionage case in the nation's history. It would be many years before the damage to the CIA's reputation would be repaired, and some may argue that to this day the wound has still not fully healed. The long list of sources that Ames compromised tells a heartbreaking tale. Among the men compromised were Colonel Oleg Gordievsky and Adolf Tolkachev. Gordievsky was the head of the London KGB station who became a spy for MI6 as a result of his ideological convictions. Gordievsky was exposed as a double agent by Ames in 1985. Gordievsky was extremely fortunate in that he and his MI6 handlers managed to pull off an elaborate escape. Adolf Tolkachev was not so fortunate. An electrical engineer and one of the chief designers at the Soviet Fazotron Company, Tolkachev passed information to the CIA between 1979 and 1985, compromising multiple radar and missile secrets, as well as turning over classified information on avionics to the USA. He was arrested in 1985 after being compromised by both Ames and Edward Lee Howard and was executed in the Soviet Union for his treason in 1986. Today, Ames serves his sentence in the federal prison system. Rosario completed her five-year sentence and was released, whereafter she returned to live in Colombia. The answer to the question of whether Rosario knew that Ames was spying for the Soviets, and if so, for how long, remains murky. The general consensus is that she only truly learned of Ames's activities in the summer of 1992 after finding operational notes in his wallet. Monitored telephone calls between Ames and Rosario in 1993 suggested that even if she didn't know the full extent of her husband's treachery, she knew that he had been meeting KGB agents. Yet even if she didn't know the full picture and true source of her husband's wealth from the get-go, she had no trouble spending it and being complicit in filing falsified tax returns along with her husband. The narrative of Aldrich Ames, whether painted as a hero or a traitor, is largely a matter of perspective, 
a reflection of one's historical vantage point and perhaps which side of the Iron Curtain one called home. What remains indisputable, however, is the audacious scale of Ames's deception. He orchestrated the most significant betrayal in the annals of U.S. intelligence, and he did so with an astonishing lack of subterfuge, his actions barely concealed beneath the veneer of his everyday life. Ames was not driven by ideological convictions, as some spies are. His betrayal was fueled by avarice, a desire for financial gain that overrode any moral qualms about the potential fallout of his actions. He knew the risks he was taking, the lives he was endangering, and yet he proceeded undeterred by the potential human cost. In the end, the price of Ames's treachery was steep. At least ten men met an untimely end, their lives traded for the trappings of wealth, a larger house, a second-hand Jaguar, and a collection of designer handbags. But there are some who believe that not all the compromised agents can be pinned on Ames, nor the other moles identified prior to or after Ames's arrest. During his debriefing, the timeline of events given by Ames did not always match up with the events that occurred. This has left some to believe that there was or is another unknown mole within the ranks of the CIA. Perhaps even to this day there lurks another mole within American intelligence betraying secrets and causing havoc. Only time will tell if another, like Aldrich Ames, will emerge. An explorer, a big game hunter, a saboteur, and a certified lunatic. These are just a few of the personas adopted by a man who is considered one of the most iconic and notorious spies of the 20th century. Yet for a man of his spying prowess, few today know his real name. Known at various points of his life either as the Black Panther, the Duke, or the man who killed Kitchener, he was handsome, charismatic, intelligent, and fluent in several languages. To some, he was just a common shyster and a con man, while to others, he was a master spy and saboteur. For a man as enigmatic and complex as South African-born super spy Fritz Duquesne, the truth probably lies somewhere in between. Born on the 21st of September 1877 in East London in South Africa, Fritz Joubert Duquesne was descended from a mix of French refugees and Dutch settlers. As a young boy, he lived on the frontier of the British-controlled Cape Colony. There he experienced the tension that existed and the frequent conflicts between the British Empire, the Boer Republics and the local Bantu tribes. During his early childhood, Fritz's family moved to Nilestrom, an area in the northern part of the South African Republic. His father established a farm from which he made his trade as a hunter. Before he was even a teenager, Fritz killed a man for the first time, defending his mother against attack by a local Zulu. Trouble and conflict were never far off for the Duquesne family, who were once driven off their farm by Nguni tribesmen. Legend has it that in the skirmish that followed, Fritz killed a number of Impi warriors. The Duquesne family valued education, and so at age 17 Fritz was sent off somewhat ironically to England where he attended university in London and thereafter the Royal Military Academy in Brussels. The outbreak of the Second Boer War on the 11th of October 1899 forced 22-year-old Fritz to return to South Africa. He joined the fighting as a member of a Boer commando, gaining a fearsome fighting reputation and styling himself as the Black Panther. During the siege of Ladysmith, Fritz was wounded in the right shoulder and a month later was captured by the British at the Battle of Colenso. He soon, however, managed to escape captivity, fleeing first to Durban along the east coast of South Africa and later rejoining his unit. In August of 1900, Boer forces were driven back to Mozambique. Falling back with his comrades, Fritz was again taken as a prisoner of war. This time he was shipped off to Caldas da Reinha, an internment camp near Lisbon. Fritz immediately began plotting his escape. He managed to charm a prison guard's daughter who agreed to aid him in his escape from the camp. After slipping away, he travelled from Lisbon to Paris and then finally on to Aldershot in England. And so, Fritz found himself among his most hated enemy, the British. Believing his best bet was to fight his enemy from the inside out, he joined the British Army and secured a posting to Cape Town in 1901. Thus, for the first time, Fritz became a double agent. 
When his regiment marched through Nilestrom, Fritz was confronted with the ruins of his family's farm, a casualty of Lord Kitchener's ruthless scorched earth policy. The discovery of his sister's brutal murder at the hands of the English and his mother's internment in a concentration camp ignited in him a flame of hatred for England that would never fully be extinguished. Fritz returned to Cape Town with a new secret agenda, to sabotage English installations and assassinate Lord Kitchener, whatever the cost. He recruited a team of twenty Boer men to support his cause and carry out his murderous plot. Before his plan could be put into action, the British received a tip-off and pounced on Fritz while he attended a dinner for the governor of the Cape Colony. Promptly arrested and court-martialed, he was sentenced to death along with his co-conspirators for treason. His fellow saboteurs met their end swiftly by firing squad, but Fritz Duquesne managed to negotiate his sentence down to life imprisonment. He did this by promising to reveal secret Boer communication codes and to translate Boer dispatches for the British. Fritz, however, never had any intention of making good on his promise. Imprisoned in the fortified castle of Good Hope in Cape Town, Fritz spent every night chipping away with a spoon at the walls of his cell. He would have escaped from prison a third time but for a large stone that was dislodged, trapping him in his tunnel. There he was discovered by a prison guard, unconscious but otherwise unharmed. Not long after his attempted escape, Fritz was shipped off, along with 360 other Boer prisoners, to the Imperial Fortress Colony on Burt's Island, off the coast of Bermuda. The British thought that escape from the storm-ravaged archipelago, surrounded by shark-infested waters and treacherous reefs, was impossible. Fritz Duquesne disagreed with that assessment. On the night of the 25th of June, 1902, he managed to escape the prison fortress by scaling a barbed wire fence and swimming one and a half miles undetected past patrol boats and spotlights. Using a distant lighthouse as a guide, he made it back to mainland Bermuda, where a group of fellow Boers arranged for his departure from the island. Within a week, Duquesne was on a boat bound for Baltimore, Maryland, leaving behind the pink beaches of his island prison with the prospects of a new life before him. Upon arrival in the USA, Fritz made his way to the bustling metropolis of New York City. There he secured a position as a journalist for the New York Herald and made a living spinning captivating tales of adventure. By 1908, Fritz had solidified his reputation as a globe-trotting war correspondent. In 1910, he married for the first and only time. His marriage to Alice Wortley, an American woman, ended childless and in divorce eight years later. During this period in America's history, the nation was suffering from a severe meat shortage. Immigration meant that city populations were exploding and the meat industry simply couldn't keep up. Ever the schemer, Fritz, along with two other men, including U.S. Congressman Robert Broussard, came up with an ingenious plan. Their solution? Hippopotamus ranching. The three men formed the new Food Supply Society in 1910 and proposed to import the African hippos into the Louisiana bayous as a food source. As an added benefit, the hippos would also control the growth of an invasive plant species, killing fish populations and blocking local waterways. Despite punting hippopotamus meat as delicious lake cow bacon, the American hippo bill was never passed and the organization was soon disbanded. While the hippo plan never saw fruition, Fritz's scheming and campaigning connected him with U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt. Fritz became Roosevelt's personal shooting instructor, even accompanying him on an East African hunting expedition. Although his life had seemingly moved on from the battlefields of South Africa, the embers of Fritz's hatred for the British still burned inside his belly. As the dawn of the First World War broke in 1914, Fritz would soon be presented with an opportunity for retribution. After crossing paths with a German-American industrialist in the heartland of America in 1914, Fritz was recruited as a German spy and saboteur. Assuming the name Frederick Fredericks, he was sent on his first assignment to Brazil under the guise of being a scientist researching the rubber plant. His true mission as an agent for German naval intelligence was to disrupt commercial traffic to countries at war with Germany. From his base in Bahia, Brazil, Duquesne orchestrated a series of attacks on British merchant ships. His weapon of choice was the time bomb, which he cunningly disguised in cases marked as carrying mineral samples. He went on a sabotage spree, claiming later to have sunk 22 ships. 
But before long his cover was blown when an accomplice named Bauer was arrested by MI5 and identified Fritz Duquesne as the mastermind behind the naval sabotage operation. With his cover compromised, Fritz eluded the British by slipping away to Buenos Aires. In a theatrical twist, and to throw his pursuers off his scent, he planted an article in the New York Times reporting his death at the hands of Amazonian tribesmen while leading an expedition to Bolivia. After his obituary was published, Fritz had a change of heart. Being dead, he would lose his American passport, and thus the protection against British prosecution afforded to him under the Neutrality Act. A few weeks later, he managed to feed another fake story to the press, this time reporting that he had not in fact died, but was rescued by government troops after being badly wounded. While Fritz Duquesne had managed yet again to slip away from his pursuers, it wouldn't be long before he re-emerged with an entirely new identity. Of all the legends surrounding the life of Fritz Duquesne, perhaps the most outrageous is the tale of how he became known as the man who killed Kitchener, his sworn enemy. In 1916, while posing as Russian Duke Boris Zakrevsky, Fritz joined Field Marshal Kitchener on HMS Hampshire in Scotland. Kitchener was, of course, Fritz's arch-nemesis, as the architect of the scorched earth policy that saw the destruction of the Duquesne family farm and the death of his family members. Fritz came up with a cunning plan to engineer the demise of his foe and his men. Once aboard the ship, Fritz signalled a German submarine by dropping self-igniting flares from a porthole. The HMS Hampshire was struck by a torpedo, causing it to sink, killing all but twelve men on board. Kitchener, too, went to his watery grave. Fritz made his escape on a life raft before the ship was torpedoed and sunk. According to legend, he was awarded the Iron Cross for his valour. While he appears in photos adorned with the military award along with many others of dubious origin, no records to either confirm or refute the story survived the war. Today, it is generally accepted that HMS Hampshire sank after striking a mine laid by a German U-boat. Whether the story is true or not, Fritz became known henceforth as the man who killed Kitchener. As World War I raged on, Fritz felt it was high time that he reinvented himself. He adopted the persona of Captain Claude Stoughton, an allied war hero of the Western Australian Light Horse Regiment. As a raconteur extraordinaire, he captivated New York audiences with his fabricated tales of bravery and war, earning for himself a decent living in the process. However, his past caught up with him in November 1917 when he was arrested in New York on charges of insurance fraud. He had brazenly filed fraudulent insurance claims for the loss of the mineral samples he used to disguise what were, in fact, his time bombs. When arrested, he was found in possession of a file of news clippings related to the bombing of ships and a letter from an assistant German vice-consul acknowledging Duquesne's service to the German cause. Wanted by the British to face prosecution for murder on the high seas and arson, Fritz's luck was running out as he sat in a U.S. jail while he awaited extradition to England to be tried by the British Crown. The trick he had up his sleeve this time to make his escape was as ridiculous as it was cunning. Fritz feigned paralysis, a charade that he maintained for nearly two years and that saw him transferred to the prison ward at Bellevue Hospital. Mere days before his extradition, Fritz made his move. Disguising himself as a woman, he soared through the bars of his jail cell and scaled the barrier walls of the hospital to freedom. Fritz flew below the radar for a few years after his escape, most likely spending the time living in Mexico. He eventually returned to New York in 1926. Little is known about this period of Duquesne's life, save that he worked as a freelance journalist and commissioned the writing of his biography. The book, titled The Man Who Killed Kitchener, was equal parts embellishment and fabrication. Yet however much he tried, Fritz Duquesne could never manage to outrun the magnitude of the events from his past. On the 23rd of May, 1932, he was once more arrested in New York for his wartime crimes. It is believed that his true identity was given up to the FBI by a woman he was dating at the time. His defense at his trial was led by famed attorney Arthur Garfield Hayes. After Britain declined to pursue his war crimes due to the statute of limitations, the judge dismissed the remaining charge of escape from prison and Fritz was granted his freedom. Despite another close call with the law, Fritz had no plans of settling down. 
In 1934, Duquesne was recruited as an intelligence officer for the Order of 76, a pro-Nazi American organization. By January 1935, he had infiltrated and was working for the U.S. government's Works Progress Administration. As the clouds of war gathered over Europe in the 1930s, Fritz's past work in World War I had not been forgotten by the Germans. Admiral Wilhelm Canaris, the head of German military intelligence, the Abwehr, had been keeping a close eye on Duquesne. When the opportunity arose in 1937, Canaris instructed his new chief of operations in the U.S., Colonel Nicholas Ritter, to reconnect with Duquesne. Duquesne and Ritter met covertly in New York on the 3rd of December 1937, marking the beginning of a new chapter in Duquesne's life as a spy. Fritz immediately set to work building an espionage network within America to feed information back to Germany. As much as America was following its isolationist policy, it was already growing in power in all spheres of influence. There was the distinct possibility of the USA being drawn into a global conflict that many could already see shimmering on time's horizon. The Germans wanted to keep tabs on all the intelligence they could gather and wherever possible sway political opinions and policies in their favour. There was no better man tasked with the job than the master spy himself, the Duke. Fritz actively recruited new members to serve in what would become with 33 active agents, the largest German spy ring to ever operate in the USA. Among its members was Heinrich Stade, a German musician who moved to the USA after World War I. He, like many other disaffected German immigrants, resented his nation's treatment after the war and was thus susceptible to recruitment as a spy. From musicians to engineers, dock workers to airport staff, the men and women recruited were already firmly entrenched in New York society by the time Hitler rose to power in 1933. Operating from within its base at the Little Casino restaurant in Manhattan, the intelligence gathered by Fritz and his agents was transmitted secretly back to Germany. Yet much like a chain, a spy ring will only ever be as strong as its weakest link. For Fritz Duquesne, that weak link was California aircraft worker William Siebold. He was recruited by the Abwehr after harm was threatened to his family. He was sent to America under the alias Harry Sawyer, tasked with the mission of infiltrating the U.S. National Guard. Siebold took his first opportunity after arriving in the USA to spill the beans on the German spy ring to the FBI. He was promptly recruited as a double agent. His mission, infiltrate the Duquesne spy ring and help to bring it down. After U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt was briefed on the matter, FBI agent Newkirk, operating under the alias Ray McManus, was assigned to the Duquesne case. The FBI rented a room directly above Fritz's apartment near Central Park, setting up hidden microphones to record the conversations happening in the apartment below. A covert operation was also set up in Times Square, whereby the FBI leased three adjacent rooms. One room served as an office for Sibold, where he would receive intelligence reports from Abwehr spies. These reports would then be censored by the FBI and partially transmitted by Sebold via coded shortwave radio to Germany to maintain his cover. The other two rooms were occupied by German-speaking FBI agents who listened in on the meetings and recorded them using a camera hidden behind a two-way mirror. By this stage of his life, Fritz Duquesne was a seasoned spy. He caused stress levels among the FBI agents to rise when he first visited Siebold's office by conducting a thorough examination of the premises, checking corners, opening chests, and scrutinizing mirrors. He even asked Sebold pointedly and with hardly a trace of humor, where are the mics? But having found no evidence of surveillance, Duquesne revealed to Siebold documents hidden in his sock. These included a sketch and photo of the M1 Garand semi-automatic rifle, a drawing of a new light tank design, a photo of a U.S. Navy mosquito boat, a photo of a grenade launcher, and reports on U.S. tanks he had observed at bases at West Point and in Tennessee. For two years, the FBI continued monitoring the activities of the various spies that came and went from Siebold's office. By the middle of June 1941, the FBI decided they had enough evidence and that it was time to bring down the Duquesne spy ring. At its height, Fritz had spies operating from New York to California and Detroit and across the ocean to London, Berlin and beyond. In June 1941, the dragnet closed around the now infamous Duquesne spy ring. Fritz and 32 of his German spies were arrested in a massive sting operation. After being picked up, 
They were collectively charged with transmitting classified information about American weaponry and shipping activities to Germany. The echoes of the Pearl Harbor attack by Japan and Germany's declaration of war on the United States were still fresh when, on the 2nd of January 1942, the 33 spies were handed a collective sentence of over 300 years in prison. The dismantling of Duquesne's ring of spies dealt a crippling blow to German intelligence operations in the United States. For Hitler, it couldn't have come at a worse time, for America had just entered the war. J. Edgar Hoover, the then director of the FBI, proudly proclaimed the operation as the most successful spy roundup in the history of the United States. This time, the 64-year-old Duquesne could not elude the clutches of justice. He was handed an 18-year prison sentence, along with a concurrent two-year sentence and a $2,000 fine for violating the Foreign Agents Registration Act. His sentence began in the Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary in Kansas. It wasn't long after his incarceration that Fritz's physical and mental health began to decline, and this time, genuinely so. In 1945, he was transferred to the Medical Center for Federal Prisoners in Springfield, Missouri. Fritz was ultimately released in 1954 due to his ill health after serving 13 years of his sentence. Fritz Duquesne did not go down in a blaze of glory, as his former exploits may have predicted, for he died indigent on the 24th of May 1956 at City Hospital on Roosevelt Island, aged 78. Looking back at the life of Fritz Joubert Duquesne, it is hard to sift fiction from fact, and this is precisely how the great spy would have had it. He was a man as enigmatic as the tales he spun. His life was a tapestry of intrigue, woven with threads of both truth and deception. With legendary charm, formidable intelligence, and linguistic prowess, those who flew within his orbit were inevitably drawn in by his charisma. While Duquesne ultimately found himself on the wrong side of history, it is hard not to acknowledge and admire a spy expertly exercising his trade. This is James Durwood Harper, Jr. He was an electronics engineer living in the heart of Silicon Valley during the peaks of the 20th century technology booms. He was the quintessential high-tech entrepreneur of his day. He was an engineering whiz and an inventor, but also an embezzler, alcoholic, and a cheat. But he was even more than all these things. He was also a spy, selling America's most classified secrets on ballistic missile technology to the Soviet bloc during a critical time of the Cold War arms race. Harper's betrayal was of the kind not seen since the likes of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg decades earlier. The effects of his espionage and the secrets he gave away relating to ballistic missile technology are likely still being felt by the USA today. For the first time, Zach Dorfman, an award-winning intelligence and national security journalist, reveals the true story of James Harper in his new podcast, Spy Valley. Based on declassified documents, court exhibits, and countless hours of telephone interviews with James Harper himself, Zach brings to light a tale of espionage and betrayal on the grandest of scales. Thank you to Zach and Project Brazen for providing the channel with advanced access to listen to the podcast. See the links in the description below to listen to Spy Valley, an engineer's nuclear betrayal, available wherever you get your podcasts. James Derwood Harper Jr. was born in 1933. He was the middle child of three boys. Growing up in Fresno, California, he and his brothers displayed a talent for electronics. The Harper family moved around a lot during World War II, but eventually settled in Fairfield, California, on the fringes of the Bay Area. James Harper's life would forever be inextricably linked to the hub for technology companies and innovation birthed in Northern California in the 1940s and 50s. Silicon Valley took its name from the development of silicon-based microchips and other technologies developed in the region. A magnet for high-tech corporations and venture capitalists, Silicon Valley played a vital role in developing U.S. military technologies and applications. It also became a breeding ground for corporate espionage and Cold War spying. It was this confluence of factors that would later send young James Harper down a dark path. 
During his high school years, James Harper was the typical football jock and muscle car buff. James was drafted into the military after finishing high school, but never saw any fighting as the Korean War conflict drew to its end. He used the time instead to hone his skills in electronic engineering. After completing his military service, he secured a job in Southern California during the boom of the aerospace industry. Harper worked for a company with lucrative Pentagon contracts designing the U.S.'s first intercontinental ballistic missiles. He left this job after narrowly avoiding being decapitated when an experiment on solid rocket fuels went horribly wrong. In his new role, he worked on nuclear warning systems in Alaska, more specifically the White Alice Early Warning Communications Network. He spent 18 months in northern Alaska, and then a further stint at a remote base called Tin City, which was just 55 miles from Siberia. But for a man with an entrepreneurial spirit, James Harper soon heeded the call to return to Silicon Valley to seek his fortune in the private sector. By the mid-1960s, James Harper was living the Silicon Valley dream. He had married his first wife, Colleen, and had started a family, and was riding the wave of the Valley Tech Boom. He started his own company, Harper Magnetics, and things were on the up and up. Yet, as Harper's story will show, he never knew when he had a good thing going. He met a woman by the name of Louise Howell. Her green eyes and blonde hair proved irresistible for a man like Harper, and they soon began an affair together. Their alcohol-fueled entanglement was one of bust-up and make-up. The illicit relationship didn't last, with Louise choosing to move away to San Francisco to put distance between her and Harper after the affair ended. Harper's split from his girlfriend was not his only concern. His company, Harper Magnetics, was in financial freefall and soon declared bankruptcy. Picking up the pieces of his life, Harper went to work for Fairchild Semiconductor, the company that helped to invent the silicon microchip that gave the valley its now iconic name. Not content to remain an employee, Harper soon struck out on his own again, founding a new company called Harper Time and Electronics. He invented the world's first digital stopwatch, which he called the AccuSplit. Harper was, however, soon ousted from his own company after being accused of embezzling funds. By the mid-1970s, James Harper's once bright light was burning out. He had separated from his wife, drank to excess, had multiple affairs and gambled compulsively. Always looking for the next big thing, Harper began to associate with one of the big players in Silicon Valley, a man by the name of Bill Hugel. Bill Hugel played a key role in the birth of Silicon Valley, co-founding the Global Semiconductor Trade Association, and even running, albeit unsuccessfully, for Congress as a Democratic candidate in 1972. Hugel never let scruples get in the way of a good business deal. He believed in free trade, even with his nation's biggest rival, the Soviets. He was secretly working for the Polish intelligence services, acquiring and selling prohibited technology to the Soviet bloc via the Poles. Harper saw Hugel as his mentor and wanted in on a piece of the action. After gaining Hugel's trust, Harper became an enforcer of sorts, traveling around to intimidate those who needed intimidating and no doubt greasing a few palms. He was also given shopping lists of electronic components requested by the KGB, which he would source for Hugel in exchange for payment. But this was small fry, earning him a few thousand dollars here and there, and was not the sort of windfall a man like Harper was after. It would be a chance encounter at a bar with an old flame that would set the wheels in motion for Harper's big payday and one of the greatest intelligence coups of the Cold War. One night, while drinking at one of his customary Silicon Valley watering holes, in walked Harper's old girlfriend. He hadn't seen her in 13 years. In that time, Louise had been married and divorced, but still went by her husband's last name, Shula. Louise and Harper got to chatting. Louise was working for a Bay Area tech firm called Systems Control Incorporated. The company was working on highly classified ballistic missile research on behalf of the US government. Louise was the assistant to the company's president, Robert Larson. She was also his mistress. This was the moment the light bulb went on for Harper. 
Systems Control Incorporated no doubt had a trove of information that would be of great value to the Soviets. What if Louise could get her hands on it for him? As luck would have it, Louise Schuler knew the safe in which her boss kept the most highly classified research, and her birthday was the combination to open it. As the 1970s drew to a close, Harper saw his opportunity to do a deal with Bill Hugel and his Polish connections. Bill Hugel had by that stage moved to Europe. This was to avoid the heat from an ongoing FBI investigation into his trade dealings with the Soviet bloc. Harper contacted Hugel and arranged a meeting to discuss business. Under the pretense of taking a family holiday, Harper travelled to Geneva to meet Hugel in July 1979. Harper gave Hugel a rundown of the sort of secret missile information he could get his hands on. This included highly classified materials relating to the development of the Minuteman intercontinental ballistic missile. The Minuteman was the first solid-fuel ICBM deployed by the United States and a major breakthrough in missile technology. These missiles for the first time provided the capability to strike targets across the globe within a matter of hours. Combined with a nuclear warhead, the Minuteman ICBM became a key component of the United States land-based nuclear arsenal and one of the legs of its nuclear triad deterrent system. Deployed for the first time in 1970, the Minuteman III is still the mainstay of America's nuclear arsenal. The technical specifications, manuals and testing data that James Harper was offering to sell could very well have tipped the Cold War nuclear arms race in favour of the Soviets. It is no wonder that Harper had dollar signs in his eyes. Hugel said that he would relay this information to his contact in Warsaw to gauge their interest. It was just a few days later that Harper received a response. The KGB was interested, very interested. It was agreed that Harper would fly to Warsaw to meet with Hugel's Polish connection, a man by the name of Zysław Zihodzin. Officially a minister of the machine tool industry in Poland, he was an agent for the Polish intelligence services, which for all intents and purposes was controlled by the KGB. Whisked through customs at Warsaw Airport, Harper was put up in a fancy hotel and soon met with Zihodzin along with Hugel. He had brought with him a small sample of nuclear-related documents stolen from Larson's safe, along with a list of the other documents he knew he could supply later on. Sir Hojin was impressed. The men struck a deal. Payment of $15,000 would be given in exchange for the documents, split equally between Hugel, Harper and Louise. Harper was careful initially to protect Louise's identity. He didn't want the Soviets getting too close to his source. There was, however, a catch. Sohojin would only pay the money during their next meeting, and after it had been determined whether the information Harper was supplying was of any value. Harper, cunning as always, bulked up his documents with unclassified information in an attempt to justify his high price. As important as they were, there was no chance of the Soviets paying the princely sum of one million dollars Harper was demanding. While the question of price hung in the air, Harper was told by Sehojin to get as much information as he could grab. And so, upon returning to the U.S., he and Louise started pilfering documents from Larson's safe wholesale. They accessed the office after hours, removing reams of documents from the safe, returning to Louise's flat to photocopy documents long into the night. Louise would return the documents early the next morning before they had a chance to be missed. In the midst of all this, Harper and Louise Schuler had rekindled their romance and were living together. After they had stolen all they could, Harper and Hugel arranged to meet Sohojin again a few months later. This time the meeting took place in Vienna, the spy capital of the world. Harper arrived in October 1979 and checked himself into the Intercontinental Hotel. Louise happened to be attending a conference in Europe at the time and met up with Harper in Vienna once it was finished. Harper, Hugel and Sohojin met in a hotel room where Harper revealed to Sohojin the sort of documents he had brought with him. It was then that Harper made one among many of his brash moves. He told Sohojin that Louise would later collect the $15,000 they were owed from the last meeting and would hand over the latest set of photocopied documents. Harper, was letting his source of the secret documents get dangerously close to the Soviets. Sometime later, 
When Louise dropped off the documents, Sehojin didn't pay up. Louise returned to Harper's hotel room empty-handed, followed shortly thereafter by an irate Sehojin. The two men had an argument over the money, with Sehojin telling Harper that his documents were child's play and as worthless as a cold cup of pea. When Hugel learned of what had happened, his temper boiled over. He marched to the hotel bar where Sehojin was and got into a shouting match with him. A loud argument over money between an American and a Polish man in central Vienna wasn't exactly inconspicuous, and Harper got spooked. He and Louise decided to hotfoot it back to the United States. Sehojin refusing to pay and minimizing the value of the documents was likely part of a strategy to drive down Harper's price. Harper had, however, agreed on a contingency plan with Hugel, who had undertaken to pay Harper if the Soviets didn't hold up their end of the bargain. Hugel, of course, never paid. Harper's relationship with Hugel began to fray. Harper was starting to get desperate. He was broke. He had revealed his source for the American missile secrets, his relationship with Hugel was breaking down, and the Soviets didn't want to pay him. Calling Sehojin's bluff and seeing no other way but forward, Harper and Louise pressed on, copying as much as 100 pounds worth of documents from Larson's safe. The couple were sitting on a gold mine of secret information, but it was too dangerous to hold the documents for so long while they waited to see whether a deal with the Poles could be struck. As always, Harper had a plan. He called on his buddy Jack Stouffer to help him bury the documents along the Sacramento River Delta. Stouffer, having no qualms, agreed to help. Stuffed into cardboard boxes, Stouffer took Harper out on his trimaran sailboat to a small island where Harper dug furiously, burying the documents three feet deep in the mud and sand. After this was done, Harper needed to find a way to get in touch with Zahojin and without Hugel catching wind of it. Harper called on a former girlfriend he had in Switzerland by the name of Yuda Bushley, who he used as a cutout to broker a meeting for him with Zahojin. And so Harper flew back to Warsaw in May 1980. This time things were different. Zahojin welcomed Harper with open arms, even bringing out a fat wad of $100 bills, being the $15,000 he was owed from their last meeting. Harper was finally in on the money, but he took only $10,000, fearing that taking Hugel's cut could cause him more trouble than it was worth. Despite the Soviets' very clear interest in Harper's stolen documents, there was no way they were going to pay him one million dollars. Ultimately, they offered him one hundred thousand. For Harper, this was enough. He raced back to Silicon Valley with plans to retrieve his buried cache of documents. With the help of Stouffer, Harper made it back to where he had buried the documents. But he was faced with a huge problem. The river had flooded, and the island on which he had buried the documents had been completely submerged. Although the waters had subsided, the documents were waterlogged. Panicking at the thought of his payday having been destroyed, Harper took the soggy boxes back to Shuler's flat, where they painstakingly dried all the pages out. After a few days of waiting, Harper breathed a huge sigh of relief. The documents were still legible. It was time to head back to Warsaw and deliver his payload. Harper arrived back in Poland in June 1980, armed with suitcases full of stolen missile secrets. This time he met Zahojin in a chalet on the outskirts of Warsaw. Harper handed over the suitcases to the KGB, who had flown in 20 agents to scrutinize the 2100 pages of documents he had brought. 24 hours later, Harper was met with good news. He was going to be paid. He was handed a thick envelope filled with $100 bills. He then had to figure out how he was going to get his dodgy cash payout back home. He took a booze-filled trip to Switzerland with his European girlfriend, Yuda Bushley, and wasted some of his ill-gotten gains at the casino. He tried to deposit the cash into a newly opened French bank account, but the bank wouldn't touch it as Harper couldn't establish the source of the funds. Running out of options, Harper decided there was nothing for it but to strap $50,000 to each of his legs and hope for the best at airport security. And this is exactly what he did. By sheer luck, he made it through security and customs without being checked. Once home, Harper gave his pal Stouffer $20,000 for his help in hiding the documents and kept the rest for himself and Schuler. 
The couple then took a trip to Reno, where they married at some point during their drinking frenzies. Whether they married for love or for the legal protections afforded spouses remains an open question. Harper travelled to Poland on a few more occasions, returning home each time with cash after selling more secret documents. The Poles eventually decided that it was too big a risk for Harper to be bringing in such large quantities of classified documents into the country. Given that Harper had refused to use a camcorder provided to him to videotape the documents, it was decided that he would in future meet with a new Polish handler in Mexico known as Jacques. In December 1980, Harper met Jacques for the first time in Mexico City. At their second meeting, Harper and Schuler handed over documents that were more valuable to the Soviets than any that had been provided previously. But Harper was getting nervous. He didn't like the long distance he had to travel to Mexico City. After voicing his concerns, the next rendezvous was in Matamoros, which is much further north, closer to the U.S. border. Harper was becoming erratic. Having spent the past two years selling secrets to the Soviets, his paranoia started to set in. At some meetings, he would not bring any documents, yet demanded more money for previous deliveries. The Soviets started to grow impatient. Travelling once again to Warsaw in November 1981, Harper's meeting with Zahojin was strained. The men ultimately agreed that Harper would meet Jacques in Mexico early in 1982 to hand over another 29 documents on the KGB's shopping list. The meeting, however, never happened. A few weeks before the scheduled date, Harper received a coded postcard from Jacques, which he knew meant the meeting was off. Harper had already been paid at least $250,000, but it looked like his money tap was running dry. He was also worried about being caught. To protect himself against possible prosecution in the future and scheming for another big payout, Harper was about to set in action his most brazen scheme yet. Enter Bill Doherty, an ex-Marine, fighter pilot and respected member of his community. Also, he happened to be a defense lawyer who represented high-profile American turncoats. Harper's grand plan was to turn himself into the FBI, to cut a deal and get rich in the process. Using the not very creative pseudonym J, Harper contacted Bill Doherty seeking legal representation. He wanted to switch sides, to go from American traitor to American hero. Harper's deal was that in exchange for immunity from prosecution and a fat paycheck, he would become a double agent and spy against the Soviet Union. Doherty took on the case of his anonymous client and got in touch with the FBI. The entire proposition was of course ludicrous, but the FBI's spy hunters wanted to keep mysterious Jay on side. The FBI hoped that the drip feed of clues and information would eventually lead them to the spy they had already been hunting. What Harper and Doherty didn't know was that the CIA was already aware that they had a spy on their hands. A CIA mole working for the Polish intelligence services, codenamed Caribou, had warned the CIA that a spy operating in Silicon Valley was handing over top-secret nuclear information to the Poles. How did Caribou know this? He found out at a cocktail party in Warsaw when a senior Polish intelligence officer was presented with a medal by the KGB for obtaining extremely valuable intelligence from an American source. That intelligence officer was none other than Zahojin. Caribou told the CIA about how the KGB had flown in a team of specialists to Warsaw to pour over the trove of intelligence that the American mole had supplied. These revelations sparked a massive mole hunt, but for months the FBI spun its wheels, unable to identify the Silicon Valley spy. However, with the information being received from Doherty, it was only a matter of time before the FBI connected the dots. Harper's approach to the FBI came at a pivotal moment in the Cold War. 1983 was a particularly tense period between the United States and Soviet Union. The Russians were convinced that the US was planning a nuclear preemptive strike, a belief stoked in part by the NATO Able Archer military exercise. For the CIA and the FBI, apprehending the spy who was selling the US's most valuable secrets relating to ballistic missile technology was mission critical. James Harper spent weeks recounting his exploits to his lawyer. While he used code names for all his associates, he eventually identified Bill Hugel by name. This was big for the FBI had been looking into Hugel's affairs for years by that point. 
Dougal's phone was tapped, but as a seasoned and savvy dealer, he wasn't about to discuss his illicit dealings openly over the phone. A break in the case would eventually come. One Sunday morning, Harper bumped into an engineering colleague while he was out on a run. They talked business and went their separate ways. Harper later disclosed the name of this engineer to Doherty, who in turn passed the information on to the FBI. In March 1983, the FBI managed to track down the engineer and conduct an interview. That engineer mentioned a name that the FBI had never heard before, James Harper. The investigators were left scratching their heads. James Harper didn't have any security clearance at that time, nor did he work with anything related to ballistic missiles. They eventually managed to solve the puzzle. They discovered that Harper had a girlfriend, Louise Schuler, who absolutely did have access to top-secret missile information. This was enough to tap Harper's phone and to place him under constant surveillance. The FBI learned that Harper and Schuler were planning a holiday to Petrolia in California. The FBI was concerned that they would stash documents down there, or worse, attempt to make a run for it. The FBI surveilled Harper and Schuler during their vacation, but to no avail. After Harper and Schuler returned home, the FBI continued to watch and wait. By mid-1983, Louise Schuler was on her deathbed. She had been drinking since a young girl and had become a lifelong alcoholic. She was suffering from advanced cirrhosis of the liver, and she didn't have long to live. During this time, the FBI observed Harper leaving their apartment to jog, but in actual fact, he was sneaking out to visit a local girlfriend. Louise Schuler died on the 22nd of June 1983, aged just 39. Soon after Schuler's death, Harper eloped with a girlfriend living in Nevada. He was tailed to Reno, where he intended to get married. Returning to Silicon Valley, the FBI listened in to conversations in which Harper boasted to his brother about the money he was stashing in the Cayman Islands, to his first wife Colleen about how he would never have to work another day in his life, and to his daughter about how he never paid any taxes. But in the hours of recorded telephone conversations, he hadn't said anything about nuclear espionage, nor where he had hidden the rest of the secret documents. The FBI hadn't observed him do anything illegal either. There just wasn't enough for Harper to be arrested. In the spring of 1983, John Gibbons of the U.S. Attorney's Office in San Francisco received a call from the Department of Justice. Gibbons was told that Harper was seeking full immunity from prosecution and large sums of money in exchange for becoming a double agent for the CIA. After years of selling the most damaging secrets to the Soviets, Harper thought the country he betrayed would be interested in working with him and paying him for the privilege. There was of course not going to be any deal. All that Harper had achieved with his final gambit was to hand himself over to the authorities on a silver platter. While the FBI wanted to arrest Harper immediately, Gibbons was reluctant before direct evidence of Harper's treason had been established. In the summer of 1983, the CIA's prize agent Caribou defected to the USA with the help of his handlers. After years of helping the US, he had the promise of a new life, but first, his newly adopted country needed him to do one last job for them. The Department of Justice wanted him to testify against Harper at trial. He was their best bet at securing a conviction. This was a huge ask. While Caribou and his family were living under the protection of the CIA, exposing himself in a public trial might place him in grave danger. After the Polish learned of his defection, he was sentenced to death in absentia. The CIA was protective of their asset, and they had a long-fought tussle with the Department of Justice as to whether or not Caribou would be required to testify. Prosecutors could see a way forward at trial provided Caribou testified, and so it was decided to bring Harper's spy games to an end. On the 15th of October 1983, Harper awoke as usual and mooched around his apartment, coffee in hand while he read the newspaper. Little did he know that FBI agents had his apartment encircled. In a moment, the tranquility of Harper's apartment was shattered as dozens of agents burst through the door and swarmed around him. While Harper was in police custody, the authorities had a long way to go to prove his guilt in a court of law. 
The CIA had declined to allow the DOJ to call their agent Caribou as their star witness. Prosecutors would have to get on without him. Given that their months-long surveillance program had found no smoking gun, the prosecution needed Harper to confess. The case was first assigned to Judge Sam Conti of the Federal District Court. He had a reputation for coming down hard on criminals. Although the U.S. Supreme Court had recently ruled that convicted spies were precluded from receiving the death penalty, Judge Conti still managed to put the fear of God into Harper. Trembling at the thought of what may be in store for him, James Harper was given the hard sell. Confess, and perhaps the judge would be more lenient with his sentence. Take the matter to trial, and the prosecutors would throw everything they had at him. It didn't take Harper long to take the deal. He confessed to it all, including the roles played by Louise Schuler, Bill Hugel and Jack Stouffer. On the 19th of May, 1984, James Harper was sentenced to life imprisonment. Stouffer never saw the inside of a prison cell. He took to his boat and sailed south to Mexico. He never reached his destination and it is believed he had an accident at sea and drowned. In the wake of the trial, the FBI and CIA were chomping at the bit to get at Bill Hugel, but despite a thorough search of his home and the scouring of his finances, they couldn't find enough evidence to press charges. Hugel was far more careful and less brash than his former enforcer James Harper. At trial, it would have been the word of Harper, a convicted spy against one of the captains of industry in Silicon Valley. Hugel nevertheless decided to leave the US, settling in Switzerland. He died in 2003, aged 76. Harper spent 30 years in a federal penitentiary. He was eventually paroled in 2016 and spent the rest of his life living in northwest Arkansas. He was by that stage an old man in ill health, living far away from his native California and estranged from his family. James Harper died in August 2022 at 89 years of age. Ironically, due to his time serving in the military, he was granted a soldier's burial. George Blake was the embodiment of the quintessential British gentleman. Charismatic, intelligent and radiating charm, he was to MI6 the very model of an intelligence officer. However, beneath this polished exterior lay a mastermind of deception. Enthralled by the promise of a communist utopia and disillusioned by NATO military tactics during the Korean War, Blake turned his back on his homeland, betraying national secrets and fellow agents to the Soviets during the tense 1950s era of the Cold War. Unlike many of those whom he betrayed, Blake went on to enjoy a long life in Moscow, courtesy of the Kremlin. With decades to ponder his life's choices, he harbored no regrets. To the very end, he remained a contented spy, his conscience unburdened, believing that in the world of espionage, no one is truly innocent. This is the story of George Blake. Britain's greatest traitor. Born on the 11th of November 1922 in Rotterdam, George's birthplace was a melting pot of cultures and ideas, perhaps foreshadowing his complex beliefs and ideals. His family name was originally Behar. His father, Albert, was born in Egypt and was of Jewish descent. George grew up enjoying the tales told by his father of his service in the French Foreign Legion and the British Army during World War I. Albert was injured during the war, having deep facial scars from flying shrapnel and damaged lungs following a gas attack. Shortly after the war, Albert was posted to Rotterdam, where he settled and met George's mother, Catherine. She was Dutch, upper middle class, and a remonstrant Protestant. At some point, perhaps through his military service, Albert was granted a British passport, as a result of which young George was born a British citizen. George had two younger sisters, Adele and Elizabeth. For most of their early years, the family lived comfortably among bourgeois, conservative circles in the Netherlands. Idolizing the Dutch royal family, George became a Calvinist and intended to become a pastor in the Dutch Reformed Church. The Baha family saw their fortunes dashed when Albert's business was affected like so many others by the 1929 Wall Street crash. 
George was only 13 when in 1936 his father passed away after finally succumbing to his wartime injuries. George was shocked to learn of his Jewish heritage upon his father's death, a fact which Albert had kept secret. This loss, combined with the ongoing economic hardships of the 1930s, caused young George to be relocated to live with his wealthy aunt Zafira in Egypt. In this new environment, he pursued his education at the English school in Cairo. It was also here that George began to assemble the beginnings of his ideological worldview. He grew close to his cousin, Henry Curiel, an extroverted womanizer and a fervent Marxist. Curiel went on to spearhead the communist democratic movement for national liberation in Egypt. Henri was repeatedly arrested and imprisoned and would eventually be assassinated by right-wing extremists in Paris. Their interactions were profound, with George admitting in 1991 that Curiel's influence played a pivotal role in shaping his political beliefs. Despite this, George returned to Holland still influenced by his mother's strong Protestant faith and his ambition to enter the church. When the Second World War broke out, George was back in the Netherlands on a summer visit. He endured Nazi Germany's Blitzkrieg in May 1940 of Rotterdam, cycling away from the decimated old city to The Hague where his mother and sisters were living. Upon arrival, he found that they had already fled to England. As the German war machine marched across Western Europe, George refused to leave his home nation, choosing instead to join the Dutch resistance as a courier. He was motivated by a multitude of factors, his pro-British sentiments and citizenship, his half-Jewish background, and the brutal occupation of his Dutch homeland. Despite being apprehended by the Germans, his youth played to his advantage, and he was released, given he was only 17. For nearly two years after that, he dodged German patrols to deliver underground papers and intelligence on German army positions to the Allies. After he turned 18, George felt that he had more to offer the war effort than merely running messages across occupied Netherlands. He was at the time living with a family in the southern Dutch village of Zundert. Together with the two daughters of the household, he planned to make his escape and ultimately rejoin his family in England. The first leg of his journey involved the crossing of the Dutch border into Belgium. The three were confronted by a soldier a mere 100 yards from the border, but fortunately the daughters knew the Austro-German soldier from attendance at the local Catholic church. He was waved through the border and into Belgium. He continued his harrowing journey through occupied France and into Spain. There he was interred for three months until Spanish dictator Franco chose to reinstate Spanish neutrality. Upon his release, George pressed on to Gibraltar and finally reached London by January 1943. Upon his arrival in England, he was briefly detained for security investigation at the Royal Victoria Patriotic School in Wandsworth, South London. After passing the necessary checks, George was finally reunited with his mother and sisters. In a bid to start anew, they anglicised their surname by changing it from Behar to Blake. Determined to continue the fight against the Nazis, he joined the Royal Navy. He learned of a branch of the Navy called the Special Service, which he promptly signed up for. Much to his disappointment, this did not involve spying or espionage, but rather the operation of two-man mini-submarines. Initially posted to the submarine branch, he was found unfit for the role due to his propensity to pass out when underwater. However, his fluency in Dutch and German and his time serving in the resistance caught the attention of the SIS. Soon after, in 1944, an SIS headhunter recruited George Blake, giving him his first taste of covert activity with the Special Operations Executive. He was initially disappointed not to be sent to Holland. Instead, as part of the SOE's Dutch section, he supported resistance movements in Europe by training agents who were sent to the Netherlands and worked on decoding the material they sent back. Having developed a solid reputation among his peers, he was soon identified for promotion by his superiors. In September 1945, MI6 dispatched him to Hamburg for his first taste of operations in the field. In the aftermath of the war, Blake found himself working for the Naval Intelligence Unit. His duties mostly included interrogating former German U-boat commanders to establish whether the men were founding an underground Nazi resistance movement. He was also tasked with spying on Soviet forces, and he quickly realized that former German officers, many of whom were in dire financial straits, 
were willing to use their extensive contacts in East Germany to work on building a local intelligence network. The mission was a resounding success, with Blake playing a pivotal role in establishing a network of agents right in the heart of East Germany. This success, combined with Blake's talent for languages, resulted in him being sent by MI6 to Cambridge University after his return to Britain. In the face of the ever-growing threat of communism from the Soviet Union, George Blake was tasked with deepening his understanding of the Russian language. Cambridge was not just an academic hub, it was a fertile ground for recruiting both MI6 agents and, as history would later reveal, double agents for the KGB. Here, George was lectured by an English professor whose mother was Russian. She didn't preach communism, but had a deep-rooted love for Russian culture and the Orthodox Church. Under her tutelage, George found himself increasingly drawn to Russia. This growing fascination was more than just academic curiosity. It was the first sign of a shift in George's ideological compass. While not yet a communist, the seeds were sown, and his next assignment would be the catalyst for a switching of allegiances. On November 6, 1948, George Blake was dispatched to the British legation in Seoul, South Korea. While his official title was that of Vice Consul, his true mission was far more covert. Blake was tasked with gathering intelligence on the communist activities in North Korea, China, and the Soviet Far East. Korea became a battleground of ideologies after its division along the 38th parallel in 1948. The Soviet Union backed the North, while the United States supported an aggressively anti-communist regime in the South. George Blake was sent into this perilous environment armed with little more than his wits and diplomatic cover. His mission to establish an agent network in North Korea proved largely futile and over time he grew increasingly disillusioned with America's puppet administration in Seoul, which he came to view as fascist. The geopolitical landscape then shifted dramatically on June 25, 1950, when the Korean War erupted. In a swift and unexpected move, the Korean People's Army from the North overran Seoul. As British forces rallied to the defense of the South under the banner of the United Nations Command, Blake, along with his fellow British diplomats, were taken prisoner by North Korean forces. As the war's momentum shifted, the prisoners were moved further north, journeying through Pyongyang and eventually to the Yalu River. It was during this period that he witnessed the devastating bombings of North Korea. The scale of the destruction inflicted by the U.S. Air Force by their B-17 flying fortresses was of a scale surpassing anything Blake had seen before, and it filled him with shame. While imprisoned, he immersed himself in the writings of Karl Marx and Vladimir Lenin, books that had been sent to the North Korean prison camp by a nearby office of the German Stasi. Blake's profound ideological transformation was starting to reach its zenith. He'd become convinced that the triumph of communism would herald a more peaceful era for humanity, juxtaposed against the materialist and imperialist convictions of the USA. He embraced communism, and in so doing, found his allegiance to the West wavering. In the autumn of 1951, Blake took a decisive step. He handed his captors a note written in Russian, addressed to the Soviet embassy, indicating he had important information to share. While Blake never revealed the full details of his recruitment into the KGB, what is known is that he started meeting with a young KGB officer named Nikolai Loenko, who was sent to the camp to recruit prospective Western spies among the prisoners. To test his bona fides, Blake was told to write down everything he knew about the structure of the SIS. This he promptly did, and when it was compared against the information British double agent Kim Philby had already provided the KGB, it was a dead match. With this, George Blake's recruitment as a double agent for the KGB was complete. Joseph Stalin died on March 5, 1953. With the appointment of Nikita Khrushchev as the Soviet Union's new premier, Tensions between East and West began to ease. Arrangements were soon made for Blake and his fellow prisoners to be released in a prisoner exchange. Upon his return to England on April 22, 1953, Blake was set to rise through the ranks of MI6, but all the while played a dangerous double game. To the world, he was a loyal British intelligence officer and a heroic former prisoner of war. Yet in truth, he was the KGB's most promising agent in place within British intelligence. George Blake, codenamed Diamid, 
was about to embark on his path to infamy. In September of 1953, Blake resumed his work for SIS and was stationed at its offices at 2 Carlton Gardens. There he met SIS secretary Gillian Allen, whom he soon started dating. Despite the couple falling in love, George was reluctant to marry, knowing that the path he had chosen would eventually drag her down a dark, complicated path. Nevertheless, Gillian persisted with George, with the result that they were married in September 1954. The couple went on to have three children together, all boys named Anthony, James and Patrick. Within a month of his return to England, Blake met with KGB agent Sergei Kondrashev. He was a rising young intelligence officer dispatched by the KGB with the sole responsibility of running Moscow's mole inside MI6. Kondrashev was a recent addition to the KGB's Foreign Intelligence Directorate, which meant that his photograph was not yet in MI5's file of known Soviet spies. The initial meeting between the spy and his handler was a chance for the two to get acquainted and to discuss logistics, including Blake's need for a camera to photograph classified documents. Kondrashev promptly supplied the necessary equipment, and Blake began funneling a treasure trove of top-secret MI6 material to the KGB. Blake later became known as the Lunchtime Spy, taking the opportunity when his colleagues were out for lunch to photograph classified materials. He was meticulous in his methods, using a Minox camera to capture about 200 exposures a month of documents he had legitimate access to in the course of his employment, thereby avoiding suspicion. Blake unveiled intricate details about Western espionage methods and intelligence structures. He compromised many operations and forced a complete overhaul of British intelligence procedures after his betrayal was discovered. Once secure in their covert identities, undercover agents were exposed by Blake, leading to ruined careers, arrests and in many cases executions behind the Iron Curtain. In April 1955, George Blake received a new posting to Berlin, the very front line of the ideological battleground of the Cold War. Moving his family to Germany, he was based in the SIS offices attached to Hitler's Olympic Stadium. Ironically, he was tasked with recruiting Soviet double agents. It was while stationed in Berlin that Blake made perhaps his most significant betrayal, being the exposure of Operation Gold, a joint British and American surveillance program. This top-secret initiative saw the Allies constructing what became known as the Berlin Tunnel to tap into Soviet communication lines in Germany. This joint venture between the CIA and MI6 aimed to intercept the Soviets' shift from radio to landline communications. The Soviets had relocated their most secure communications underground in Berlin, and the Allies sought to tap into these lines as a means of gaining an early insight into Soviet intentions in Europe. The tunnel's construction was a significant engineering challenge, not least because of its length, 1,476 feet, slightly longer than the height of the Empire State Building. The operation was ambitious and costly, with a final bill exceeding $6.5 million. How Blake managed to compromise the operation was really quite simple. He happened to be the secretary at the meeting where the operation was initially planned, and he made an extra copy of the minutes and a sketch of the tunnel, which he promptly handed over to Kondrashev. The West's grand spying operation was compromised from the very beginning. The KGB, however, faced a dilemma. Ending Operation Gold too early would have risked compromising one of their most valuable double agents. Knowledge of the operation was restricted to only a few select KGB leaders, and for the time being chose to do nothing. Evidently, George Blake's value as an agent in place was worth more to the KGB than the harm they anticipated suffering as a result of Western spying. The KGB chose to bide their time until April 1956, when the tunnel was discovered in a staged event for the press. This proved of huge propaganda value to the Soviets, describing what the US and British had done as a breach of the norms of international law and a gangster act. Notwithstanding the Berlin Tunnel having been shut down after just 11 months, processing centres in London and Washington continued transcribing the hundreds of thousands of intercepted communications until September 1958. Blake managed to avoid suspicion following the Soviets' fortuitous chance discovery and for the next four years continued to systematically leak every significant secret that came his way. Blake's success as a double agent in Berlin was so significant that KGB files later smuggled out of Russia recorded that Blake had effectively neutralized Western intelligence in East Germany. 
As quickly as MI6 could recruit agents, they were compromised by Blake and rounded up by the KGB and either imprisoned or executed. But all good spy games must eventually come to an end, and as is so often the case, Blake's run would eventually be brought to an end by a betrayal from within. In the early months of 1958, the American envoy in Bern, Switzerland, was handed a perplexing letter. Within its folds was another sealed note, specifically addressed to the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. Penned in German, the letter bore the signature Heckenschutzer, translating to Sniper. Instead of reaching Hoover, the message found its way to the CIA. As weeks turned into months, the anonymous informant began revealing Soviet secrets to U.S. officials. The prevailing theory was that this covert informant was a high-ranking official in the Polish intelligence community, potentially with ties to the KGB. While initial skepticism surrounded such unsolicited informants as being potential Soviet plants, it quickly became evident that Sniper's intel was authentic. Sniper was later revealed to be Michael Golanewski, who, at the time of his first contact with the US, was the deputy head of Polish military counterintelligence. Among his startling disclosures was the very real possibility that there was a mole operating within MI6. Agent Sniper had provided the CIA with a list of seven Soviet spies working in the US, Britain and Israel, and a list of 26 Polish officials targeted for possible recruitment as agents. It was deduced by the CIA that these lists must have been obtained by the KGB from a mole in Britain's secret service. MI6 denied this, saying that it was more likely that the KGB got their hands on the document after the burglary of a safe in one of its offices in Brussels. The denial notwithstanding, MI6 embarked on an investigation of ten men who had access to the document, including Blake. All ten were exonerated. MI6 had to admit that they probably had a mole, but they had no idea who it was. By the time that Blake left his posting in Berlin and returned to London in May 1959, he was most likely still under suspicion. Nevertheless, he continued to funnel critical intelligence to his KGB handler for the next year. In September 1960, MI6 discreetly removed Blake from active duty, sending him to the Middle East Centre in Beirut under the guise of learning Arabic. Although Agent Sniper never explicitly named Blake, the trail of breadcrumbs eventually led investigators to the foot of his door. Golanewski defected to America along with his mistress in January 1961. His testimony, along with the information contained in the letters he had already sent, was the linchpin that unmasked Blake as a double agent. Had British intelligence scratched a little deeper during their initial investigation, they could have possibly stemmed the flow of information to the Soviets much sooner and saved the lives of some of their compromised agents. Nevertheless, British intelligence had to look forwards and began meticulously gathering evidence for what would be a crucial interrogation of their prime suspect. As the net tightened around Blake, and with Golanewski safely tucked away in a CIA safe house following his defection, Blake was recalled to London on the 3rd of April 1961. Although Blake was told that the purpose of his trip to London was to have a routine interview relating to his next assignment, Blake was worried. Before leaving Beirut, he met one last time with his Soviet handler on a deserted beach. He was told not to worry, that London didn't suspect a thing. Putting his trust in the KGB's intelligence, he departed for England, leaving behind his pregnant wife and two sons. Upon arrival at the SIS's personnel department in St. James's Park, Blake knew the game was up. He was met by a stern panel of MI6 agents and over the next 48 hours was subjected to an intense interrogation. He was bombarded with evidence of his spying activities and questioned relentlessly. Despite the mounting evidence, Blake staunchly denied it all, remaining cool under pressure. It seemed that against the odds he had gained the upper hand in the interrogation. However, as the hours of interrogation dragged on, Blake began to be worn down. He finally broke when CIA agents suggested to Blake that he had been tortured while a prisoner in North Korea and forced into becoming a spy. Blake immediately denied this. His knee-jerk response was to say that his decision to work with the Soviets had been entirely his own. With those words, Blake had sealed his fate. Confronted with undeniable proof and the realization that his cover was then well and truly blown, 
Blake's resistance crumbled. He began to cooperate with the CIA and MI6 investigators, revealing the depths and details of his betrayal with startling candor. The confirmation of MI6's worst fears sent shockwaves through the organization and in the Western intelligence community at large. The idea that they could be betrayed by one of their own, a man who had endured years of captivity for his country, was almost inconceivable. Blake revealed that he had disclosed to his KGB handler the entire breakdown of MI6's personnel, the location of all its safe houses, its order of battle, and its outstations across the globe. A later assessment of the damage caused by Blake to Western intelligence was seen as being much worse than Philby. According to Blake's own admissions, he had compromised nearly 400 Western agents operating covertly behind the Iron Curtain. While he had caused untold damage to Great Britain, the game was finally over and it was time for George Blake to face a jury of his peers. In May 1961, George Blake stood trial at the Old Bailey for his espionage crimes. Under the Official Secrets Act 1911, the maximum sentence for a single offence was 14 years. However, Blake's actions were split into five distinct periods, leading to five separate charges. On the 3rd of May 1961, Blake entered guilty pleas for each of the charges. Much of the trial was conducted in closed session, ostensibly to protect British intelligence secrets, but more likely to shield the government from further embarrassment. The Lord Chief Justice, Lord Parker of Waddington, handed down the maximum possible sentence, 14 years for each of three counts of spying consecutively and 14 years for the remaining two counts concurrently. This totaled a staggering 42-year imprisonment and is one of the longest non-life terms ever issued by a British court. Blake expressed his astonishment at receiving such a harsh sentence given that he had cooperated fully with the authorities and had entered guilty pleas. The harsh sentence was not enough to quell the questions lingering in the air about the integrity of the intelligence community. In the wake of the trial, Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, who had already been embarrassed by other failings of what he referred to as the so-called Secret Service, attempted to downplay the severity of Blake's betrayals to Parliament. Macmillan asserted that while Blake had indeed harmed the nation's interests, the damage was not irreparable. However, the reality was far grimmer. While Blake maintained that none of the agents he compromised faced any physical harm, MI6's assessments painted a different picture. It was estimated that at least 40 of the approximately 400 operatives compromised by Blake met an untimely end at the hands of the KGB. The CIA recognized the Blake case for what it was a profound and detrimental breach of Allied intelligence efforts against the Soviets. The trial's aftermath continued to reverberate in the months and years that followed. Macmillan's attempts to downplay the damage were met with public skepticism, and the subsequent exposure of other spies and scandals further eroded public trust. The Blake case, combined with other intelligence failures, would eventually contribute to Macmillan's resignation in 1963. Locked away in Wormwood Scrubs prison, Blake might have faded into obscurity as being just another traitor who got what he deserved. After his wife Gillian learned of her husband's betrayal, she continued in the marriage, visiting him while he was in prison. However, during a visit in 1966, Gillian broke the news to George that she had met another man and wanted to file for divorce. Serving effectively what was a life sentence and with his family falling apart, George Blake had nothing left to lose. But he was not yet done making headlines. Wormwood Scrubs, a Victorian-era prison with its imposing brick walls and watchtowers, was designed to be inescapable. But for George Blake, it became the setting for one of the most notorious prison breaks in British history. In 1961, Blake entered this fortress, a place where even the name inspired sympathy for its inmates. Inside, Blake was not a solitary figure. He made connections, notably with Sean Bourke, an Irish anti-establishment figure, and two other inmates, Pat Pottle and Michael Randall. Sean Bourke was serving a sentence of seven years for sending a bomb in a biscuit tin to a policeman. While the bomb detonated, the policeman survived. Pottle and Randall were anti-nuclear campaigners serving short stints for non-violent offences committed in the course of their peace missions. 
The men soon got to talking, and before long, they began to hatch the beginnings of a plan to spring Blake from the prison after the others had been released. As soon as the three men had served their sentences, they got to work on the outside. Bork smuggled in a two-way radio which was used to communicate with Blake and coordinate the escape. Pottle and Randall assisted in the escape plans by raising funds to purchase a getaway vehicle and to rent a London flat where Blake would hide from the authorities once he had made his escape. Eventually, the date for the escape was set for the evening of the 22nd of October 1966. After serving five years of his 42-year sentence, George Blake was going to make a break for his freedom. The plan was simple. Blake would slip away while the other inmates and guards were engrossed in the showing of a movie and would scale the prison wall with the assistance of Bork, who was to throw over a rope ladder. On this rainy evening, Blake, shielded by blankets draped over a stairwell railing, managed to squeeze through a small gap between the iron bars of a window that had been purposely broken by another inmate. He then carefully navigated the slippery roof tiles and made his way to the edge. With agility he grabbed the gutter and descended to the ground, pressing himself against the prison building. In the dim light of the prison yard's arc lamps, after what felt like an eternity, he finally saw the ladder being thrown over the wall. It looked incredibly thin and fragile, but the moment I saw it I knew nothing now would stop me," Blake later recalled. Blake successfully scaled the wall, although he fractured his wrist and was knocked momentarily unconscious after jumping from the ladder as he lowered himself to the ground. Bork bundled Blake into the getaway car, and the duo then sped away into the night. However, their getaway was not without its hitches. In their haste to flee the scene, Bork collided with another vehicle that had stopped for pedestrians. Despite the onlookers' startled stares, they managed to continue on, reaching their hideout within a few minutes. When Blake's absence from Wormwood Scrubs was finally noticed, it triggered one of the largest manhunts in British history. Officers scoured airports and embassies. False rumours circulated that Blake was going to be smuggled out of the country by hiding in a harp case belonging to the Czechoslovakian State Orchestra. In the weeks that followed Blake's daring escape, reports of Blake's sightings came from all corners of the globe. Following a tip-off, Australian authorities surrounded a plane that landed in Sydney, inspecting passengers for any sign of disguise, but Blake was not found. While all this was going on, Blake remained hidden in London, moving from one safe house to another. Blake and Bourke were considering various options to smuggle him to Russia, including dyeing his skin brown as a form of disguise or tossing him over the wall of the Soviet embassy in London. After much deliberation, Blake and Bourke decided on smuggling him out in a secret compartment of a camper van. On the night of December 17, 1966, and with George Blake stowed away in the hidden compartment, Michael Randall, his wife Anne and their children set out, aiming to cross borders under the pretense of travelling for a holiday in continental Europe. En route to Dover to catch the English Channel Crossing ferry, they were alarmed by Blake making banging noises from within his hideaway. He had a hot water bottle with him but in the confined space the pungent smell of warm rubber was causing him to retch from nausea. After discarding the bottle, they only just made it to the ferry before its midnight departure. The vehicle was waved aboard without inspection. After making the crossing, Randall and his wife drove continuously through Belgium and into West Germany, not stopping until they reached the East German helmstedt marienborn border crossing. Near Berlin, Blake was left in a wooded area near an East German checkpoint. An army officer, surprised by Blake's claim to be an Englishman, contacted the KGB. Blake's handler soon arrived on the scene and whisked him away for an initial debriefing. George Blake's gamble for his freedom had paid off. He had managed to evade the scores of British police searching for him and was soon aboard a plane destined for Moscow. The escape was a major embarrassment for liberal-minded British Home Secretary Roy Jenkins. Blake was just one in a series of high-profile prison escapes, with great train robbery prisoners Charlie Wilson and Ronnie Biggs flying the coop of the British prison system soon after in 1964 and 1965, respectively. After serving only five years of his 42-year sentence, Blake was once again a free man. The British government was left red-faced not only had one of the most notorious traitors escaped from a maximum security prison, but he had also managed to flee to the very heart of the enemy's territory. 
In the heart of Moscow, George Blake found a new beginning. Moscow became his sanctuary, a place where he could live without looking over his shoulder, but also a golden cage from which there was no return. The Soviet Union welcomed him not as a traitor, but as a hero. But the personal toll of his actions was evident. The separation from his three children was a wound that would take years to heal. In 1990, he penned his autobiography, No Other Choice, detailing his journey and the choices he made. The book reflects his somewhat deterministic view of how his life played out, perhaps a remnant of his Calvinist beliefs. Throughout his time in Moscow, Blake's relationship with communism remained unwavering despite the later revelations of the true horrors of Stalinist communism. In interviews during the 1990s, he often spoke of it as a great experiment of mankind, a vision of a just society. Yet, the weight of his decisions lingered. While he naively believed that none of the agents he betrayed faced execution, all evidence suggests that no less than 40 of those agents were killed by the KGB or those doing their bidding. Amidst the political and personal turmoil, Blake found love again. In 1968, he married Ida Mikhailovna Karayeva, and the couple welcomed a child. Time also brought reconciliation with his children from his first marriage. As the years passed, honours came his way. In 2007, on his 85th birthday, Vladimir Putin awarded him the Order of Friendship. By 2012, Blake, now 90, lived in Moscow on a KGB pension in a spacious, rent-free apartment. Age had taken a toll on his eyesight, rendering him virtually blind. Yet his beliefs remained unchanged. He saw himself not as a British traitor, but as a committed Marxist-Leninist. His assertion, to betray, you first have to belong, I never belonged, encapsulated his lifelong belief. While he was both a British and a Dutch citizen, and was fond of both peoples and cultures, he was at heart loyal only to his ideology. Addressing a press conference for Western journalists in Moscow in 1992, George Blake said, Those people who were betrayed were not innocent people. They were no better nor worse than I am. It's all part of the intelligence world. If the man who turned me in came to my house today, I'd invite him to sit down and have a cup of tea. As for Sean Bourke, he joined Blake in Moscow, where he lived for 18 months. However, a life in Russia wasn't for him, and so he returned to Ireland. Despite the British government's requests, the Irish government refused to extradite Bork, citing his part in Blake's escape as falling within the political offence exception to Ireland's extradition laws. Pat Pottle and Michael Randall were eventually prosecuted in 1991 for their role in aiding Blake in his prison escape. They too stood trial at the Old Bailey, raising as their defence that their actions were morally justified. Their motivation for helping Blake was the inhuman prison sentence imposed on him, and the poor treatment he had received from the British judicial system. Although the judge in the case directed the jury to convict, this was ignored, and the two men were unanimously acquitted. The final chapter in the life of George Blake came on December 26, 2020. At the age of 98, the former MI6 officer and Soviet spy passed away in Moscow. His death marked the end of a life that spanned almost a century, filled with twists and turns that could rival any spy thriller. The Russian Foreign Intelligence Service hailed Blake as a brilliant professional of special courage and determination. President Vladimir Putin expressed his deep condolences, stating that Blake had made a valuable contribution to ensuring strategic parity during the Cold War and maintaining peace on the planet. In contrast, in the West, the British government's response was more muted. Blake's death reignited the debate about his legacy. To some, he was a traitor who had caused immeasurable harm to his country and the free world. To others, he was a man of conviction who stood by his beliefs even when they led him down a dangerous path. George Blake was buried in Moscow's Troyekurovskoye Cemetery, in the city that had been his home for more than half a century. The simple ceremony was attended by family, friends and former KGB colleagues. As the cold winter wind swept across the cemetery, there was a sense of an era coming to an end. Regardless of your view of George Blake and the decisions he made, he was a man who played the spy game and won. In 1986, 
A chilling revelation sent shockwaves through the FBI's Soviet counterintelligence section in Washington. Two prized Soviet informants, Valery Martinov and Sergei Motorin, had been compromised. Once exposed, the men were lured back to Moscow and brutally executed. A bullet in the head for each, the KGB's grim signature for traitors. The loss of the two agents referred to affectionately within the FBI as M&M &M, marked an abrupt end to what had become routine covert meetings and intelligence exchanges. Parallel to this, the CIA, ensconced across the Potomac and Langley, grappled with its own nightmare. Over the years, dozens of their operatives in the Soviet Union had suddenly gone dark, were executed or imprisoned. The FBI scrambled to form an elite investigative team to unravel the mystery. Yet, as the years wore on and the puzzle remained unsolved, the unsettling possibility of the traitor being one of their own lingered in the air like a bad smell. Determined to root out the mole, experienced analysts within the FBI's Soviet unit delved into archives of debriefings and reports, searching for a pattern, a clue, anything that might reveal a link to the betrayer. They honed in on an innocent agent. Meanwhile, the culprit, who was outwardly a devout Catholic, a loving husband and father of six, and a trusted FBI agent, harbored a perilous secret. Robert Philip Hansen's decades-long path of treachery is considered the worst intelligence disaster in FBI history. This is his story. Thank you all for clicking on this video. I want to extend special thanks to all my viewers, dedicated subscribers, and the incredible members and supporters over on my Buy Me A Coffee page. Your support motivates me to keep bringing you these spy stories. If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and consider subscribing to help me grow the channel. Life began for Robert Hansen on the 18th of April 1944 in a Chicago suburb near O'Hare Airport. Robert was born to Howard and Vivian Hansen. They were quintessentially an American family, working class, Christian, and by all appearances, very respectable. Howard had served in the Navy during World War II and went on to be a career police officer for the Chicago Police Department. His mother, as was so common for the era, was a housewife. Howard Hansen was a stern disciplinarian and frequently imposed harsh punishments on his young son. Robert recounted being rolled up in an old navy mattress, trapped and frightened, or being spun around until he became sick. Punishments ostensibly aimed at toughening him up. Howard was not only strict, but also emotionally distant. He belittled Robert, which left a deep mark on his psyche. Despite Howard's harsh treatment, Robert grew up with a complicated desire for his father's approval and guidance. Robert was an only child and attended public schools. While at William Howard Taft High School, he befriended Jack Hoshauer, who would remain his closest friend for the rest of his life. The pair graduated together in 1962 and spent their spare time racing their parents' cars around the neighborhood and dreaming of becoming Formula One drivers. After high school, Robert enrolled at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois. He majored in chemistry and, in an ironic foreshadowing, also took Russian language classes. Howard wanted his son to become a doctor, wanting more for Robert than just being a cop. Robert worked at the State Psychiatric Hospital in Chicago during college summers as a recreational therapist, later convincing his friend Jack to join him there. It was here that Robert met Bernadette Walk. Known as Bonnie, she was a smart, beautiful young lady from a devout Roman Catholic family with close affiliations to Opus Dei a conservative Catholic institution known for promoting the belief that everyone is called to holiness and that ordinary life is a path to sanctity. Bonnie was born and raised in Park Ridge, an upscale suburb of Chicago in a home that valued education and religious commitment. The couple were dating when Robert graduated from college in 1966 and, pursuing his father's vocational desires for him, enrolled in Northwestern University's dental school. While studying dentistry, Robert Hansen acquired a nickname that would follow him for the rest of his life. He was called the Mortician, for always wearing a dark suit and tie, no matter the occasion. It was a sobriquet that suited not only his choice of attire,
but also his personality and physical appearance. Six foot three and walking with a bit of a lurch, he seldom socialized with his classmates, choosing instead to have lunch with various women with whom he sought companionship. Robert dropped out of dental school two years later, feeling drawn to a career more closely related to law enforcement like his father. Bonnie and Robert had continued their relationship intermittently while Robert was studying dentistry and decided in 1968 to get married. Their wedding was almost called off when, mere weeks beforehand, Bonnie received a disturbing phone call from a woman claiming to be her fiancé's girlfriend. Robert admitted to having cheated on his bride-to-be, but the couple ultimately reconciled and chose to proceed with the wedding. Shortly after they were married, Robert converted to Catholicism. This was no mere superficial change. He became deeply involved in the faith, regularly attending Mass and becoming a dedicated member of Opus Dei. His devotion was such that he often encouraged his friends and colleagues to join him at church meetings. In the early years of their marriage, Bonnie taught at the local grade school and Robert enrolled to study part-time for an MBA. He also worked for Chicago PD like his father before him, albeit as an internal affairs investigator specializing in forensic accounting. Howard had mixed feelings about his son joining the force, but sent Robert his police-issued firearm in a gesture of goodwill. In the early 1970s, America was waging war in Vietnam, and Robert's best friend Jack Hoshauer went off to join the fight. They were thus for a time separated, but their interactions during this period and thereafter would later reveal a sinister, voyeuristic element to Robert's personality. After graduating with his MBA, Robert Hansen soon had his sights set on greater things. In the mid-1970s, he applied to join the FBI. On the 12th of January 1976, Robert Hansen became an FBI special agent. He swore to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. His first post as an FBI agent was to a satellite office in Gary, Indiana where he specialized in white-collar crime investigation. He soon proved his skills as a forensic accountant and was in 1978 transferred to work in the FBI's New York office. Hansen, however, soon found his work to be boring, and he longed for something more exciting. His wish was granted when, in 1978, he was detailed to the Soviet Counterintelligence Division within the New York office. This division was involved in activities like surveillance, recruiting spies, and busting networks. His role here involved creating an automated national counterintelligence database for the FBI, leveraging his background in accounting and computer skills. This position gave him a comprehensive overview of the espionage landscape in New York, a hotbed for Soviet bloc espionage activities. He had access to the file room and spent hours poring over Soviet espionage cases, developing somewhat of a romanticized fascination for spying. Extremely conservative and anti-communist almost to a level of cartoonishness, Robert Bob Hansen was climbing the bureaucratic ladder. However, beneath this veneer of professionalism and devout religious practice, Robert harbored secrets that would eventually not only shock his family, but also bring the FBI to its knees. When moving to New York, he relocated his family, consisting of his wife Bonnie and three children at the time, to Scarsdale, Westchester County. As a single-income household, the cost of living was high, and Robert began to feel burdened by his mortgage payments and the cost of sending his children to private Catholic schools. Five months into his new assignment in New York, Robert Hansen decided to turn traitor. Two blocks from Grand Central Terminal in New York City stood a 22-story building that housed the Amtorg Trading Corporation. This was a Soviet export agency and trade representation responsible for negotiating deals between the Soviet Union and American companies. This was at least its public persona. In reality, it served as a front for bringing in KGB and GRU spies. One day in 1979, Hansen walked through Amtorg's front door, took the elevator up to its offices, and delivered an anonymous letter to Soviet military intelligence, the GRU. While seeming quite brazen, Hansen's decision to volunteer his services to the Soviets was calculated. He knew that there was no surveillance of the front door to Amtorg, 
and that as such, his clandestine visit would remain a secret. In offering his services to the Soviets, Hansen said later that he hoped to make a little extra cash to supplement his inadequate federal salary, but intended to get out of the spy game quickly. This initial move into treachery, however, would mark the first of three distinct periods of Robert Hansen's life in which he spied for the Soviets, earning for himself hundreds of thousands of dollars and in the process betraying his colleagues, Soviet agents in place for the US, and his entire nation. The final years of the 1970s and the first half of the 1980s were a period of heightened tension and conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, a phase often referred to as the Second Cold War. This era was marked by a sharp increase in hostility and escalating tensions between the two superpowers. The Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan in 1979 brought about the end of the detente, and the fighting of other proxy wars in Central America and Africa served to re-intensify geopolitical rivalries. This was the context in which Robert Hansen first found himself as a spy for Russia. During this first period of his espionage, it is believed Hansen received around $21,000 from the Russians, effectively doubling his annual FBI salary. The information he volunteered during this period included tipping off the GRU that the FBI had bugged a residential complex in New York popular among Soviet officials. His most damaging disclosure during this period was, however, when he revealed the identity of one of the US's most valuable informants, codenamed Top Hat. Dmitry Polyakov was a major general in the GRU who was recruited as a spy by the CIA in the mid-1960s. Polyakov was likely compromised also by CIA double agent Aldrich Ames and was ultimately tried and executed by the Soviet Union in 1986 for crimes of espionage. It didn't take a crack team of investigators to bring an end to Hansen's first period as a Soviet spy. It was his wife, Bonnie, who discovered his treason. One night in 1980, Robert had retreated to his basement in secret to write a letter to his GRU handler. Bonnie ventured downstairs and, seeing him at work, confronted him about what he was up to. Given his history of infidelity, Bonnie had good reason to be distrustful of her husband. Robert denied an affair, but when Bonnie grabbed the letter and had a look at it, Robert admitted that he was selling information to the Russians. He said, however, that he was feeding them false information and thus doing no harm. This, of course, couldn't have been further from the truth. Bonnie remained uncomfortable about what her husband was doing and implored him to stop. She suggested that they visit their priest for guidance. The priest's advice was that Hansen should immediately stop what he was doing and turn himself into the FBI. Perhaps after considering the repercussions for Robert Hansen if he did this, the priest advised that what Robert should do instead was cut off all contact with the Russians and agree never to do it again. He was also told to turn over his ill-gotten gains to Mother Teresa. There's no record of Hansen ever having paid the money to charity, but he did, at least for a time, break off contact with his Russian handler. Towards the end of 1980, thus ended Robert Hansen's first period as a spy for Russia. For the next five years, Bob Hansen's life seemed to return to a semblance of normality, devoid of any high treason and clandestine correspondence. He had been promoted to supervisor in the FBI, and he was finally getting on top of the mortgage that weighed so heavily on his finances. Yet it was during this period in 1985 that Hansen chose to re-establish contact with the Russians. While money probably was a factor in his decision, it is believed that his low self-esteem also played a role. He had a desire for recognition that his position at the FBI was not providing. He considered himself the smartest man in any room he walked into and was frustrated to see others being promoted ahead of him. His fascination with all things espionage also continued to grow with Robert even carrying with him a Walter PPK pistol, the same model famously used by James Bond. Bob Hansen re-established contact with the Russians by writing a letter to a low-level KGB officer living in Northern Virginia, whom he knew was not being surveilled. Inside this letter was another addressed to KGB spymaster Viktor Cherkashin, stationed at the Soviet Embassy in Washington. To establish his worth as a spy and to prove his bona fides, 
Robert revealed in this letter the names of three Russian men who had been recruited as informants by US intelligence. These men were Boris Usin, Sergei Motorin, and Valery Martinov. In exchange for all the information he had provided, Hansen requested payment of $100,000 and set out a plan for his long-term espionage relationship between him and the KGB. This included for further payments in diamonds rather than cash, and for his eventual exfiltration to Russia. As before, Robert remained anonymous. The KGB wouldn't learn of Hansen's true identity until many years later, knowing him only by the false names he chose for himself, the most frequent of which was Raymond Garcia. Hansen's spycraft was meticulous, providing detailed instructions to the KGB as to how they would communicate with each other and execute dead drop exchanges. He implemented a system of signals using white adhesive tape in specific locations for the spy and his handler to know when packages had been loaded in their hiding spots. His spycraft, however, sometimes crossed over from meticulous to convoluted, with the result that in 1986 a package was left for Hansen by his KGB under the wrong corner of a bridge in a park and could not be located by Hansen. These missteps notwithstanding, it is estimated that during his second period of spying, Robert Hansen handed over more than 6,000 pages of classified materials and 26 CDs to the KGB, earning him as much as 500,000 US dollars. As a result of Hansen's betrayal, Boris Yuzhin, a KGB officer assigned to the Soviet consulate in San Francisco, was sent to a Siberian prison where he remained for five years until the fall of the Soviet Union. Motorin and Martinov, or m and as they were known to the FBI, were both recalled to Moscow, put on trial, and ultimately executed. Over and above the human cost, Hansen also compromised top-secret US intelligence operations, resulting in millions of wasted dollars and virtually crippling US national security. A key operation exposed by Hansen to the KGB was called VIDS, or Vehicle Identification System. Long before tracking technology was available to the public, the FBI had invented a small tracking device that could be attached to vehicles. This was meant to weed out Russian intelligence officers, but was rendered useless by Hansen. Another FBI effort ruined by Hansen was Operation Monopoly. This was a brazen plan starting in 1977 to dig a tunnel underneath the Soviet diplomatic compound in Washington to install listening devices. The operation was costly and complicated, the building works being conducted under the cover of darkness and in secret. The operation was, however, poorly planned and badly executed, producing not a scrap of valuable intelligence for the FBI. To top it all, it was later discovered that the tunnel had been compromised by Hansen during its construction and was thus doomed to fail from the very beginning. Finally, and most crucially, Robert Hansen compromised one of the most top-secret operations he was privy to, the Continuity of Government Plan. This initiative, first instituted during the presidency of Dwight D. Eisenhower in 1953, was designed to ensure the ability of the US government to continue to function in the event of nuclear war. This included the relocation of the US president and other key figures in government to secret locations scattered across the country. Bob Hansen thus delivered into the hands of the Soviets the winning ticket should the Cold War have ever turned hot. For six years, Robert Hansen continued selling secrets to the Soviets in exchange for large sums of cash and diamonds. It was not only in his professional life that Hansen was duplicitous. His personal and family life was also merely a charade. When Bob and Bonnie were in the first few years of their marriage, Robert's friend Jack Hoshauer had gone off to fight in Vietnam. One day, Jack received a letter from his friend Bob. Inside, Jack was shocked to find a series of nude photos of Bonnie. Jack wrote to his friend to say that he must have sent him the photos by mistake. Bob Hansen simply replied to say that he hoped Jack enjoyed the little morale booster he had sent him. This was the first in a series of acts by Robert Hansen in which he would reveal himself to be a voyeur and an exhibitionist. After Jack had returned from Vietnam, he was visiting Bob at the Hansen family home in Virginia. Bonnie Hansen was in the shower. Bob Hansen invited his friend Jack to watch his wife naked in the bathroom. Despite the peer pressure, Jack on that occasion refused. 
It was not long after that that Robert Hansen started inviting Jack to watch him be intimate with his wife Bonnie. Eventually, Jack gave in and became an active participant, peeping through the bedroom window from the back deck of the Hansen family home. After it became too cold at night for Jack to watch from his hiding spot outside, Robert installed a hidden camera in his bedroom so that Jack could watch on a TV in another room. In the 1990s, Hansen also posted erotic stories about Bonnie online. Bizarrely, he posted these under his real name. This sort of behaviour continued for years, all the while Bonnie was unaware of the indignity she was being subjected to at the hands of her husband. In the late 1980s, Robert Hansen also began frequenting a local strip club called Joanna's 1819. In 1990, during one of his lunchtime visits, he met a dancer by the name of Priscilla Sue Gailey. Dancing under various stage names and known to regulars at the club as Hot Legs, Robert became infatuated with the dark-haired, blue-eyed young lady in her early 30s. He sent a $10 bill to her dressing room after her set. The pair soon met and began chatting, and Robert handed her his business card. He spun her the story of being at the club to catch spies. The second time they met, Hansen bought Priscilla a diamond and sapphire necklace, which she gratefully accepted. The relationship blossomed from there, with Robert becoming Priscilla's regular patron. He showered her with gifts and money, all courtesy of the KGB. He loaned her his BMW when she needed to practice for her driving test. Better yet, he bought her her very own champagne silver Mercedes-Benz, which was accompanied by an American Express card that she could use for motoring expenses. When Hansen was due to take a work trip to Hong Kong, he bought her a ticket and invited her to join him there, travelling separately of course to maintain appearances. During the trip, Hansen worked during the day while Priscilla went out on shopping sprees. They met up in the evenings for dinner and drinks at lavish bars and restaurants. Both Robert and Priscilla maintained that their relationship was platonic. Despite her many offers, including during the final evening of their stay in Hong Kong, they were never physically intimate. Be this as it may, there's no doubt that there was an emotional affair between the two. It is quite possible also that Hansen was grooming Priscilla to aid him in his spying activities, perhaps to use her as a cutout in later exchanges with the Russians. For about a year the relationship continued, until all of a sudden Hansen brought it to an abrupt end. In December 1991, following the radical reforms by Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev, and the breakaway of many of these socialist republics, the hammer and sickle flag was lowered from the Kremlin and the Soviet Union officially dissolved. Robert Hansen went to ground during this period, not knowing what organization would emerge in the wake of the dismantling of the KGB and the GRU, and what the geopolitical landscape would look like in the immediate future. With the stroke of Gorbachev's pen, Hansen's money tap ran dry. It is quite remarkable that Bob Hansen managed to emerge from the 1980s unscathed. The mid-80s, in particular 1985 and 1986, saw a great many US double agents smoked out and arrested, whether it was John Walker of the US Navy, Larry Chin of the CIA, or Ronald Pelton of the NSA, US intelligence was rocked by scandal after scandal as each spy was arrested. If one thing was certain, US national security institutions had been thoroughly penetrated. The reasons that Hansen managed to remain undetected are varied, however, his meticulous tradecraft and anonymity helped to shield him from prying eyes. Notwithstanding the revelation of all these spies, the CIA continued to lose agents in place. They were convinced that there were more moles within the ranks of American intelligence. Even the most fastidious of spies are bound to slip up eventually, and this is precisely what happened in the case of Robert Hansen. His brother-in-law, Mark Walk, was also an FBI agent. Mark learned of three pieces of information which, when triangulated, began to rouse his suspicions. First, in 1990, while attending an FBI conference, he was told in confidence that there was a mole hunt on the go. Then, he found out through his wife that Bonnie Hansen had revealed that she had found $5,000 in cash hidden in Robert's sock drawer. The third and final tidbit 
was a casual remark made by Robert about the possibility of retiring to live in Poland one day. That was rather odd, considering that Poland sat firmly behind the Iron Curtain. While there are conflicting versions of precisely what happened next, Mark Walk maintains that he disclosed all this information to his FBI supervisor. Whether or not this actually happened, no further actions were taken at that time. Hansen's career continued its upward trajectory, which by 1991 saw him promoted to FBI Unit Chief 2. Hansen, however, began acting erratically. He hacked into a superior's computer and then reported it, supposedly to demonstrate how IT security needed improving. Then he had an altercation with FBI agent Kimberly Lichtenberg, whom he pulled to the ground, severely injuring the tendons in her arm after she excused herself from a meeting and walked out of Hansen's office. While Lichtenberg was paid workers' compensation for her injuries, no meaningful disciplinary action was taken against Hansen. By July 1993, Hansen started to experience cash flow issues. He had not been working for the Soviets for 18 months and was even asking family members to borrow money. He decided, therefore, that it was time once again to sell his nation's secrets. What he didn't know was how to establish contact with the Russians. Part of the fallout from the end of the Soviet Union was the dismantling of the KGB. What emerged was the Foreign Intelligence Service, or SVR, and the Federal Security Service, the FSB. The GRU, however, which is the Russian Federation's Foreign Military Intelligence Agency, continued to exist. It was the GRU that Hansen contacted during his first period as a spy, and so he saw fit to rekindle the relationship. His approach this time was haphazard and risky in comparison to his prior cautious approaches. After identifying a GRU officer as his target, he brazenly approached him at a parking lot near to the officer's home. Hansen identified himself using his alias Raymond Garcia and attempted to hand over a package. The officer, having no idea who the man was, jumped into his car and sped away. He promptly reported the incident to his superiors. It was taken as a provocation and a protest was lodged with the US State Department. When the FBI was told that the person had described himself as a disaffected FBI agent, the Bureau undertook a cursory investigation which led nowhere. Whether it was that Hansen was spooked by the incident or simply didn't find another opportunity to make contact, he went dark for the next six years. In the mid-1990s, American intelligence agencies were still losing agents in droves and wasting millions of taxpayers' money on compromised clandestine operations. They all knew, notwithstanding the outing of a great many double agents, that they still had a leak. The FBI refused to look inwards, assuming always that the problem was in another organization. These institutionally ingrained blinkers would serve to cause more damage to the FBI than it could ever realize. While the hunt was on for another mole, the investigators focused almost solely on the CIA as the source of the leak. The investigation would eventually lead to the arrest and conviction of Eldrick Ames, a CIA agent working in its Directorate of Operations. Ames, an alcoholic whose second wife had expensive tastes, had turned to the KGB in 1985 to fund a lifestyle his federal salary never could have paid for. The information he leaked led to the death of at least 10 agents in place. His treachery in many ways ran parallel to that of Robert Hansen, and the two men compromised many of the same agents and operations. After Ames received a life sentence in 1994 and his wife Rosario Ames was also sentenced for aiding and abetting her husband, US intelligence thought it could breathe a sigh of relief. Yet, with Ames behind bars, there was still evidently a leak. After the full extent of the damage caused by Aldrich Ames had been assessed, it was determined that agents were still being lost who Ames knew nothing about, and so the spy hunt continued. Brian Kelly was a CIA officer whose life was upended by a grave and mistaken suspicion. Kelly was a loyal career CIA officer with an impeccable record. After Ames, the CIA and FBI were left desperate to root out any remaining moles. Kelly fell into the crosshairs after an illegal spy operating in Washington named Felix Block was tipped off to a CIA investigation into him. 
Brian Kelly had happened to meet with Block while both were in Paris. Analysts wrongly concluded that Kelly, who had knowledge of various other compromised operations and agents, was the man who gave the tip-off. For years, Brian Kelly lived under a cloud of suspicion. He was subjected to intense surveillance and in 1999 was made to sit through a series of grueling interrogations. He was suspended from his position at the CIA, his home life was disrupted, his career stalled and his reputation tarnished. The toll on Kelly's personal and professional life was immense and unforgiving. The truth was, however, that Brian Kelly was innocent. The real mole, as it later turned out, was again Robert Hansen. Ironically, Brian Kelly lived in the same street as Hansen and attended the same church. While the CIA and FBI busied themselves chasing their tails, a former KGB officer's star was rising. Vladimir Putin's ascension to the Russian presidency in the year 2000 had far-reaching implications in the realm of global intelligence. Putin's leadership signaled a return to certain hardline policies and a renewed emphasis on restoring Russia's influence on the global stage. It was against this backdrop of shifting power dynamics that Robert Hansen decided it was time to bring his spying hiatus to an end. His first step was to search the FBI's automated case support system for any information that could be linked to him in any way, from his prior addresses, his real name and aliases, to dead drop locations he had used, he searched it all. Over the course of a year, he thoroughly searched the FBI database nine times. After satisfying himself that nothing in the FBI computer systems could be linked back to him, he managed to deliver a letter to an officer of the SVR, the successor to the KGB. On the 6th of October 1999, Robert Hansen was welcomed back into the fold. Hansen's methods were characterized by the same meticulous attention to detail and cunning as before. He still utilized dead drops, marked by white adhesive tape, but this time in a new signal site on an electric utility pole within one of Washington's affluent neighborhoods. Meanwhile, the CIA and FBI, taking advantage of the fallout resulting from the implosion of the Soviet Union, undertook a massive program to recruit KGB agents that found themselves out of a job. Codenamed Buckler by the FBI and Racketeer by the CIA, the agencies were prepared to offer as much as $1 million to potential ex-KGB officers to work for American intelligence. Alexander Sherbakov, codenamed Mr. Pym, was one such ex-KGB officer. After he lost his job, he took to selling Russian art. He was lured to New York in June of 2000 under the pretense of meeting with an American art dealer. In truth, this art dealer was Bill Stout, a former FBI agent brought out of retirement to aid in recruiting Mr. Pym. After the initial contact had been made, FBI agents Deborah Smith and Mike Rockford were tasked with recruiting Mr. Pym. After persistent efforts and semi-hostile encounters, they finally made a breakthrough when Sherbakov revealed that he had in his possession a collection of letters exchanged between the KGB and an anonymous American mole during the Cold War. He had taken the dossier with him when he left the KGB, anticipating that it may be of value to the right bidder. The FBI ultimately agreed with Sherbakov that he would return to Russia and arrange for delivery of the dossier to the FBI. In exchange, he would receive financial support and resettlement in the United States under an assumed identity. Eventually, the dossier arrived at FBI headquarters. One of the items contained in the package was wrapped in a black trash bag with a note stuck to it which read in Russian, do not open. Sherbakov had warned that it should not be opened because it may have contained fingerprints. The package was immediately sent for forensic testing, but it would be weeks until the results were returned. As it turned out, the package had been recovered from one of the drops made by the mole. In the meantime, FBI analysts eagerly translated the letters contained in the package into English. At this stage, Brian Kelly was still the prime suspect, but nothing in the letters pointed towards him. In fact, some of the dates for dead drops recorded in the letters also coincided with a period when Kelly was in Australia. Also included in the package was an audio cassette. The tape contained a recording of a telephone conversation between the American mole and his KGB handler. It was immediately obvious that the voice was not that of Brian Kelly. The investigators were stumped. As they pored over the letters once again, one of the FBI agents, Jim Milburn, 
began to notice something strange. One of the letters used a derogatory term for the Japanese, a phrase once popular during World War II. Another letter referenced Richard M. Daly, a former Chicago mayor. These things sounded weirdly familiar to Jim. It was then that he suddenly realized he knew exactly who the mole was, the very man he used to share a cubicle with in his early days at the FBI. Robert Philip Hansen. When the results from the fingerprint analysis were returned, the investigators' strong suspicions were finally confirmed. They were a match for FBI veteran Bob Hansen. When Hansen was finally revealed to the FBI as their mole in December 2000, he was working as the FBI's liaison to the State Department. He was nearing the mandatory retirement age of 57. As much as the FBI had gathered enough evidence to arrest Hansen, catching him in the act of espionage would have likely resulted in a guilty plea deal and a conviction without the need for a trial. The plan was to make Hansen an offer he couldn't refuse, and ultimately catch him red-handed. Neil Gallagher, FBI Deputy Director at the time, called Hansen into his office to make a proposal, which was for Hansen to return to the FBI headquarters to work as a computer security expert to consult on the FBI's IT security. He was told that his mandatory retirement age would be waived and that he would be promoted to the FBI's senior executive service. The offer played to Hansen's ego. To him, it was at long last the recognition that he felt he had not received from his employer. He did, however, ask for time to consider the offer until after Christmas. This gave the FBI the time it needed to transfer the task force investigating Brian Kelly onto the Hansen case, which was codenamed Grey Day. Since Hansen had access to the FBI's computer information systems, the entire investigation had to be run on paper. Hansen was immediately placed under 24-hour surveillance, the FBI even going so far as to buy the house across the street from the Hansen home to set up a permanent watching post. His new office at FBI headquarters was created especially for him, with the room and adjoining areas wired floor to ceiling with hidden cameras and microphones. FBI Section Chief for Operations, Rich Garcia, was to be Hansen's new boss and was tasked with coordinating the construction and fit out of the new office. A young recruit, 27 year old Eric O'Neill, was brought into the fold to work as Hansen's assistant. He was a law student who, for the prior five years, had been a member of the FBI's special surveillance group which tailed high value FBI targets. He also had expertise in computers which aligned with his cover as Hansen's assistant. As part of his new role, Hansen was also granted a parking pass. In January 2001, it was discovered that he had downloaded and printed seven classified documents and was storing these in the trunk of his car, which was secretly being searched every day by the FBI. Eric O'Neill also managed to search through Hansen's satchel one day, where he found an SD card containing a letter written by Hansen to the Russians. The evidence was starting to mount up, but the FBI needed more. The real target was Hansen's beloved Palm Pilot, a device that he carried around with him everywhere in his back pocket, and very proudly made known that not even the FBI could break the encryption of the device that he had personally coded. The problem was, Hansen never let the device out of his sight. The FBI planned a ruse which they hoped would separate Hansen from his handheld computer. Hansen's bosses decided to challenge him to a shooting contest in the FBI's underground gun range. With $20 thrown down on his desk, Hansen begrudgingly got up and went down to the basement. He was gone for an hour. While Hansen was preoccupied with the shooting contest downstairs, O'Neill had managed to retrieve the Palm Pilot, a stiffy disk and another SD card and hand it over to the FBI's tech team. They promptly managed to copy all the data return the items to O'Neill who raced back upstairs to his office area and returned everything to their rightful places. The information the FBI managed to obtain was revelatory, including a letter stating the date and time of Hansen's next planned dead drop with his Russian handler. It was time to prepare a sting and to catch Hansen in the act. The dead drop had been arranged for the afternoon of Sunday the 18th of February 2001 in Foxstone Park, a suburban neighborhood in Vienna, Virginia. The specific site, codenamed Ellis, was near a footbridge leading from the main entrance to a jogging path. 
FBI Special Agents Deborah Smith and Steve Pluter were in charge of the operation that afternoon. Hansen's every movement was being tracked through surveillance and phone tapping. The FBI knew that Robert Hansen planned to give his best friend Jack Hoshauer a lift to Dulles Airport around 4pm that Sunday. Thereafter, Robert's family expected him home for dinner. Hansen was tailed by the FBI's special surveillance group to the airport. After dropping off his longtime friend, he made a sudden turnoff into the Park 7 Plaza shopping center parking lot in Northern Virginia. There he was observed preparing the dead drop package in the boot of his silver Taurus by wrapping the seven classified documents and a letter to his handlers in a black garbage bag. He got back in his car and proceeded to the drop site. The FBI watched from afar as Hansen parked his car at Foxstone Park, stuck white adhesive tape on a sign indicating to his handler that the drop had been placed, then proceeded to hide the package under the footbridge. Heavily armed SWAT teams hung back in the shadows, not sure whether Hansen, who boasted of his shooting ability and owned a large arsenal of weapons, would initiate a gunfight when confronted. As Hansen was walking back to his car, the order was given by Smith to arrest him. Immediately, two SUVs screeched to a halt and SWAT teams burst out of the vehicles. Hansen was apprehended within seconds and offered no resistance. It is traditionally reported that as he was being arrested, Hansen asked, what took you so long? Another account has it that as he was being cuffed, Hansen's remark was, so this is how it goes. The irony was that Robert Hansen had planned for this to be his final exchange with the Russians. In his letter, he hinted that he knew he was under suspicion and that his current position at the FBI was a do-nothing job designed to keep him busy but away from anything classified. Hansen was quickly bundled into the waiting SUV, read his Miranda rights, and taken to a nearby FBI office. Meanwhile, his wife Bonnie was starting to worry, as she expected Robert home for dinner hours earlier. She left her home, bound for Dulles Airport, but was intercepted by FBI agents upon her arrival. She was taken back home by the FBI, where a search warrant was executed, and the house turned upside down by agents searching for evidence. Bonnie was soon cleared of any wrongdoing or complicity in her husband's spying activities, but investigators were shocked to hear the story from Bonnie of how she discovered her husband writing a letter in secret so many years ago. It dawned on the investigators that Hansen likely started operating much earlier than they expected, as early as 1979. Before dawn the next morning, Hansen was transferred to the Orange County Jail. The FBI needed time to prepare for the media storm that was soon to be unleashed and waited to see whether any Russian SVR agent would arrive to collect Hansen's drop. Nobody ever did. As relieved as the Bureau was to have finally caught their man, they knew accusations of incompetence, lax security and sheer stupidity would be leveled against them. The news of Hansen's arrest finally broke on the following Tuesday, with FBI Director Louis Freer holding a press conference. Immediately, questions were raised. How indeed could it be that a man responsible for catching spies was himself a spy? Hansen was denied bail on the basis that he was a flight risk and had all his assets frozen. He chose Plato Kacheris as his defense lawyer who had represented infamous CIA double agent Aldrich Ames just a few years earlier. Hansen's sudden arrest was an enormous shock to his wife Bonnie, teenage children and his best friend Jack Hoshauer. Bonnie would painfully learn of her husband's relationship with Priscilla Sue Gailey through reports in the newspaper. Hansen's voyeurism also came to light, and Jack apologized to Bonnie for how he had wronged her. In the CBS podcast Agent of Betrayal, Jack came across as profoundly remorseful for what he did over so many years. Despite the revelations of her husband's double life, his betrayal and infidelity, Bonnie stuck with her husband. Robert and Bonnie remained married, with Bonnie committing her life to praying for his soul. Hansen's arrest finally served to exonerate CIA agent Brian Kelly. Although he was reinstated to his position in 2001, he died 10 years later of heart failure. His family believed firmly that the stress of the years-long accusations and investigation hastened his death. Robert Hansen's guilt was beyond a shadow of a doubt, and he knew his best bet was to negotiate a guilty plea bargain. While no spy had been executed since the Rosenbergs after the end of World War II in the United States, 
the death sentence wasn't out of the question given the nature and extent of Hansen's spying. Following a period of intense negotiation between Kacheris and lead prosecutor Randy Bellows, Hansen pleaded guilty to 15 counts of espionage, attempted espionage and conspiracy. Under the plea agreement, Hansen was sentenced to life without parole, forfeited 1.4 million US dollars paid to him by the Russians, and agreed to a six-month debriefing period with the FBI to tell all about his spying activities. In the wake of the scandal, the Commission for the Review of FBI Security Programs was established under the lead of William H. Webster. The purpose of the Webster Commission was to analyze and recommend improvements to the FBI's security programs. These were, of course, found to be deficient in terms of both security policy and practice, given the ease with which Hansen was able to carry on his activities undetected for so many years. A thorough psychological evaluation formed part of Hansen's debriefing. Psychiatrist Dr. David Charney, who was appointed by Hansen's defense team, spent over 100 hours over two years interviewing Hansen. The chief aim was to get inside the mind of a career spy to understand, firstly, whether he suffered from any psychological conditions, but perhaps more interestingly, to understand what drove him to become a spy. Of course, one of the motivations was money. Hansen had to put six kids through private Catholic school and had a mortgage to pay. He received approximately $600,000 from the Russians, either in cash or diamonds, with an additional $800,000 being paid into an escrow account in Russia for his retirement. Yet the secrets he traded were worth far more than what he received, so there must have been other driving factors. Dr. Charney highlighted a key aspect of Hansen's psyche, a deep-seated sense of inadequacy and perceived failure. These internal conflicts likely propelled him towards actions he thought would redefine his self-image. Robert's troubled relationship with his father was also opined to be fundamental to his psychological makeup. His experiences as a child, the cruel and unusual punishments, the constant denigration and belittling likely contributed to his eventual betrayal as a spy. Robert's deep-seated anger and feelings of inadequacy, bottled up for years, would occasionally erupt, and his espionage activities were seen as an outlet for these suppressed emotions. This resulted in Robert Hansen's overbearing ego. He consistently saw himself as the most intelligent individual in any given setting. When he couldn't control the situation, he resorted to violence, as was seen in the physical assault of one of his employees. Finally, Dr. Charney found that Hansen had developed a romanticized obsession with espionage. Although he worked in counterintelligence, Hansen's role as a forensic accountant and computer expert meant that he was desk-bound, and he never experienced operations in the field. The game he played with his Russian spy masters was possibly an outlet for his espionage fantasy. Hansen's mindset thus comprised an unhealthy cocktail of low self-esteem, an urge to prove his intellectual dominance, and a belief that he was beyond the reach of the law. The lack of effective deterrence within the FBI as an institution within its security systems made espionage a seemingly attainable and enticing path. The sheer contradiction that was Robert Hansen's public and private personas can hardly be ignored. He considered himself a loyal patriot, yet he sold out his nation to its biggest rival. He presented as a loyal husband, yet he exposed his wife to the indignity of a peeping Tom and pursued a relationship with another woman. The stark contrast between his public persona and his private indulgences could lead Dr. Charney to only one conclusion, that Robert Hansen was an expert in compartmentalization. Hansen served his sentence at the ADX Florence, a United States federal supermax prison where he spent 23 hours a day in solitary confinement. He lived in a concrete box and slept on a concrete bed. He was allowed one hour to exercise per day and spent most of the rest of his time reading books from the small selection in the prison library. He was housed among some of America's most notorious and dangerous violent criminals. Some may argue that this was a fate worse than death. The two decades he spent living like this behind bars took its toll on his health. Robert Philip Hansen was found unresponsive in his cell on the 5th of June 2023 and was soon pronounced dead. An autopsy revealed that he died of colon cancer. 
Upon the recommendation of the Webster Commission, the FBI implemented wholesale reforms to its security programs, including improved security education and awareness, enhancing the detection of improper computer usage, and proper compartmentalization of classified materials. Not once during his whole career was Hansen ever subjected to a polygraph test. While the efficacy of such tests are debatable, the top 500 managers in the organization are now required to submit to regular polygraph testing. Redmond's law says that it is an actuarial certainty that there is a spy in your organization. If this is anything to go by, notwithstanding these reforms and the lessons learned from the Robert Hansen story, there are many others across the world, currently undetected, selling secrets just like Robert Hansen. <laughs>